Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. Today is uh, Tuesday, August 10th, 2021, starting at exactly 529 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the 314th episode of the show. In this episode, uh, joining me today is astrologer Lisa Scheim, and we're going to be talking about movies for astrologers, which is going to be a mixture of like some movies that explicitly address astrology, but for the most part, just movies that have some sort of astrological allegory or are interesting in terms of touching on themes that are relevant to astrologers, such as uh, time, fate, free will, and other concepts like that. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks for joining me today in the studio. Quite welcome. All right. So we have a lot of we actually rewatched like a lot of old movies that we hadn't seen in years, and um, some of them are like twenty years old, and some of them were even older, and some of them were a little bit more recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good batch of these. I think we watched together about a decade ago, give or take. Yeah. And originally we had, because I'd been building this list for a while and I've been wanting to do this episode for a while or something on, vaguely like this, um, but I never had a running list. It was always in my mind and then I kind of lost it. So I've been rebuilding that list over the past few weeks. And um, yeah, so originally I was going to separate this because some of these movies are not actually great movies like in and of the, themselves, especially astrology movies and astrology documentaries. Historically, have not gone super well or turned into like really amazing, like uh, cinematic experiences necessarily. Right, exactly. This is the kind of the equivalent of retweets or not recommendations or something. Um, so some of these movies we actually enjoyed. Some of them are just interesting to talk about because they're relevant to astrology, but we're not actually like full out um, recommending as a movie per se. Yeah, although even some of the bad ones, when I went back and watched some of them, were better than I I remembered. Yeah, so yeah. We'll try to mention some of the ones that were like good in and of itself versus like some of the ones that are a little bit less good but still interesting for different reasons. Right. All right. Should we jump right into it? Sure. So I think we're going to start with the batch that's more relevant to astrology themes, not about astrology per se, right? Yeah. So one of my favorite movies is The Adjustment Bureau, which came out in 2011. And um, it was based on like a Philip K. Dick story, who's like a science fiction writer, and it starred Matt Damon and Emily Blunt. And this is a movie that you actually found and took me to, and I was really surprised because we don't always have the same taste in movies. You're not right. a big action movie fan. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I saw the description. I was like, you'll like this one. I promise. You have to go to this. <laughs> yeah, and it turned out to be right. It was a really good call. And what was the premise? Do you have like a synopsis? So the premise is basically um, there's like a young U.S. congressman who um, I'm actually going to read the little synopsis that I got um, online. So it tells the story of a U United States congressman who discovers that what appears to be chance events in his life are controlled by a mysterious, powerful group. After an event not planned by these controllers occurs, a romantic encounter with a dancer, he struggles against their manipulation despite their promise of a great future for him. So basically, he he meets this woman early in the film, and then he runs into all these like shadowy figures who are trying to keep him from like running into her again, like ever. Yeah, it's like he meet Matt Damon's character like meets her in a chance meeting, and it inspires him to do something and to make a comeback in politics. But then um, he isn't supposed to meet her again, and he like accidentally runs again into her again on the bus after one of these guys that's trailing him that turns out to be like an angel basically i forgot to say we should just say like spoilers oh, yeah. because there's no way to actually talk about these movies and the themes without giving spoilers so for we've, the most part like we're assuming you've seen most of these movies cuz we're yeah. going to talk about some pretty popular ones yeah and most of these are older there's only one that's a few years old but most of them are older than that so hopefully you've seen them if you haven't seen them look at the list of the movies first here um go see them first if you don't want spoilers and then come back and listen to this yeah um, because we're mainly going to be talking about the themes in them and some commentary and things, but we can't really not spoil the movie in order to do that. Right. So, yeah, uh, we'll just put that out there ahead of time. Spoilers. Mm -hmm. All right. So the premise, though, is like he's supposed to meet here, but there's like these angels that are um, sort of trying to work this plan where it's like a predetermined plan of like what he's supposed to do and who he's supposed to meet and get together with. And they were supposed to like stop him from running into her a second time, but one of them makes a mistake, and all of a sudden they run into each other again and fall in love. And 
he can't forget her, and so he proceeds trying to find her again. And so these other um, guys or these angels like proceed to try to stop him, and eventually tell him that he's not allowed to talk to her. Um, but he goes about trying to fight it because he doesn't believe in the plan, and he feels internally that there's something wrong with this external plan that they're trying to force on him. That's supposedly written by God or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or AKA the chairman right. um, in this movie. It's funny. It's all very bureaucratic. Like they go into like a law library looking place and, and things like that. Um, anyway, yeah, it's basically like a fight against fate is the premise. And it's like him trying to assert free will over fate. Um, he has this confrontation with them. We had, there's this quote where he, as one of the angels is like, you don't have free will, David. You just have the appearance of free will. Um, and I know that's something that's often debated within astrological circles, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it kind of ties into the ancient concept of like the daimon mm-hmm. and the idea that there are these spirits that can influence humans and like push them in certain directions to do things or not do things that they might do otherwise. And some of that's like very intimately tied up in the origins of of Western astrology and Hellenistic astrology. And it was interesting seeing it woven. That concept almost woven into a narrative here of that they can kind of influence things a little bit one way or another, but they don't have like complete control over the person. And sometimes people can like buck against the trend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that a lot too when we watched the movie, and it was kind of like the the idea that the diamonds not really there to make your life happy. It's there to keep you on plan, to keep you to your fate, basically. Yeah. Um. So that was really interesting, and then. Also, there ended up being this like other theme once you got further into the movie where it turns out that there were different versions of like the plan or of like God's plan, and that in earlier versions of it, earlier in their life, these two were supposed to be together, and that that's one of the reasons why they're still having these residual feelings of wanting to be together or that they were meant to be together um, because there was this earlier plan in which they were, but that somehow was changed at some later point. Yeah. There were actually like whole bunches of earlier plans where they, wherein they were supposed to be together. And it was only like later after like 10 different other drafts that they weren't. Um, and I thought that was actually a really interesting idea that they put in there. Um, because usually when fate and free will is debated, it's usually, um, talked about as though it's like a static thing. Like Mm -hmm. either you have a fate like singular or you have free will or you have some mixture, but not like 10 different fates, you know? Right. Um, or even like, you know, his, I think his name was like David's, mm-hmm. uh, the main character's personal had one specific like guardian angel who started helping him at one point. And that's kind of interesting because in ancient philosophy and like the Neoplatonic tradition, there was at one point this whole debate about whether you could invoke your guardian spirit or guardian angel and get them to help you to change your fate. And Iamblichus and Porphyry had this whole debate about this that's very famous. Um, And Iamblichus responds that it's ridiculous to think that you could invoke or ask your guardian angel to change your fate when the job of the guardian angel is actually to enforce your fate and make sure you follow it. Mm -hmm. So even though this is like, you know, it's like a science fiction story and then it's been turned into like a love story, romantic thriller on. For a movie and stuff, there's some interesting themes that come in and out through the movie that are actually part of the Western intellectual and metaphysical and philosophical tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the main things I wanted to talk about with this episode was movies like that, especially because those are some of the like modern myths that still tell us something, you know, about um, ideas that are in the the psyche of different like world cultures. Mm-hmm. And some of those ideas of like fate and predestination and stuff are very intimately tied in with astrology. Right. Definitely. Yeah. One of the other things I thought that was interesting about the plot there was um, the idea of ripples. They kept calling them ripples, like basically actions that would in turn um, interact with other people's life plans. And um, I always think that's interesting in terms of like, for instance, when I look at relationship astrology with people's charts, it's like you can see what's in your own chart, but you don't know what's in the other person's chart that you may not have met yet, and that can completely alter things. Mm-hmm. And so, it, you know, it just reminded me of that of all the different like timing and different charts interacting, and like who's trumps who's. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and different interactions, and then 
Um, yeah, to what extent you can change things that are predetermined because there's so much in life already that seems to be arranged in a certain sequence. But certainly once you get into astrology, I think that's the big connection here with astrology or why, even though this movie doesn't in any way deal with astrology directly, the way in which I think astrologers might view it through a certain lens. Because once you discover astrology and you discover not just um, birth charts underlying people, but also electional charts underlying events or things like a, a marriage or a first meeting chart, you realize there is this like underlying um, plan almost potentially or can be construed that way that people are sort of playing out. And the second century astrologer Vedius Valens, for example, makes an analogy that we're like actors that are playing a play and that have a specific role to play. And Try to do our best to play our part in whatever that cosmic drama is, in some sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was like very literally played out in this movie. Through they had like a book that they followed that showed people's path and showed when they were diverging from the path or when they were like right on track to do the thing that they were destined to do. Right. I really like there were a couple instances. One in which um, they said if they have a real kiss then the whole plan is messed up. Right. Um, or if he sees her dance, then it's it's all messed up. It, it's going to go that way. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was really interesting in terms of those sort of pivotal little moments like that you can track in astrology too, um, wherein, you know, this went out, this cascaded out from this particular moment in time, and you can see whatever transits or other timing you had going on at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, it sort of makes me laugh watching, you know, um, supposed angels, you know, debate like, oh no, you can't kiss or everything's done for, you know. Yeah. Well, and also that is something that legitimately happens in astrology where you'll see a timing thing happen that's really huge in the person's timeline. It's indicating a major event is happening right now that's going to change this person's life and the course of their life from this point forward. But when the event itself actually happens, sometimes at the time, it seems like a minor thing in the person's experience because they mm -hmm. don't know the long-term implications. Yeah. Um, so that can be like meeting a new person where that turns into like a major relationship or starting a new career path that you don't realize turns out to be like the person's um, destiny to fulfill and to become someone great at, or something like that. Mm. Um, the origins of many things are very small. Like, I mean, even you know, for example, in my own life, I just learned um, this past week that an astrologer named Jackie Mink has passed away, who was like a Kepler student. But she um, gave me her podcast in 2010, actually, right on my birthday, on November 1st, 2010. I took over an old podcast that she used to do called Traditional Astrology Radio, and she had done it for about a year. But she was going away to grad school, and um, I think she was going to Nick Campion's program in the UK. But so she wanted to hand over the program to somebody, so she handed it to me, and we had a connection previously where she had interviewed me, and we knew each other through Kepler. But that was, you know, the very small steps towards eventually doing starting this podcast because that gave me the experience doing that. And then eventually I got the domain theastrologypodcast.com and decided to launch something a little bit more broad than just traditional astrology. But it was that first step that really was the start of something that turned into a much larger, you know, thing in my entire life. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, it's exactly like that. And so you know, kind of like having your astrological map is akin to having those books open in the movie, and they're kind of like just plotting the path of like, where are you going from here? Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so thanks to Jackie and shout out to her um, for for doing that. And yeah, it's a good thing to think about and it's something to pay attention to and something that it takes a while to get used to. Because I remember at the time, it's like we, we knew it was notable and it was obviously synchronistic that she had handed me the show on my birthday, mm -hmm. but she did that on accident. And I, I have the actual interview that we recorded in 2010 and, and asked her jokingly if she knew she had scheduled that interview of handing over the show on my birthday, and she had no idea. Mm -hmm. It was also the start of a third house perfection year, which is funny because right? then I started um, doing a podcast and talking literally multiple times a week mm -hmm. as part of my job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, were there any other major themes in that movie? I mean, one mm -hmm. one of the themes was that sometimes 
they would do things like the different angels would do things to influence and push them in certain directions. And I thought that was interesting because I, I feel like you you will actually see that time sometimes when it comes to fate right. of a person's like trying to go in one direction and if unimpeded, they would continue in that direction. But like a, a gust of of wind metaphorically or something will happen that will alter their trajectory and push them so that they don't have any choice but to modify or go in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes in a weird way how fate works. And I guess that was the other theme of chance. And they had these like discussions that were like little off discussions occasionally in the movie of like when it was something that was purposeful versus when it was just a random act of chance right. that wasn't part of the plan or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes there being this um, weird middle ground between the two where one looked like the other, but it was really something else. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's very parallel to everyday life. And sometimes you don't know if something um, happened because it was just chance versus something that was like supposed to happen, you know, in quotes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when you use astrology, sometimes you don't know, I would say. Um, don't know what? Um, whether something was like you know, supposed to in big letters happen versus like what is the element of chance? Um, it, it also reminded me, you know, because they set up those things like you were just talking about, like um, the phones wouldn't work when he was trying to call, you know, and he kept trying to go to different places and none of the phones would work. And of course, that was a little bit of an exaggeration, but mm -hmm. that kind of thing does happen. It reminded me a little bit of um, like the um, Hellenistic timing techniques that I go releasing where it's the intersection of what you're trying to do and chance, right? And see intersection of like, are things hindering you or helping you and get what you want? Right. Yeah. I mean, and for me, some of the stuff with chance, like I don't know, um, like in some of the ancient philosophies, like chance was subservient to fate. And that's something I still feel like I see in the astrology that random chance like events often do end up being purposeful or meaningful. Mm -hmm. And even though they are that's the whole premise of divination that you can like um, shuffle up some tarot cards and then pull out a few, and the ones you pull out will be random, but will actually be meaningful and purposeful and will convey something to you about your fate, essentially. Mm -hmm. But fate is glimpsed as a result of chance, and chance, like phenomenon, acts as a gateway into understanding the inner workings of fate. Right. Um, and I think there's there's something underlying astrology that incorporates that that I've been trying to work out that I still don't have fully worked out for years, but it's the extent to which astrology itself is based on chance like phenomenon, but uses it to glimpse into a person's fate because I think it has to do with the fact that the moment of birth was also viewed as a random chance like phenomenon because normally it's outside of a person's control and it comes somewhat, unexpectedly at a specific moment in time, mm -hmm. but that if you do a freeze frame and you freeze the cosmos at that moment and look at the alignment of the planets, it turns out that there's something meaningful and purposeful about the alignment of the cosmos at that moment that will tell you something about a person's life and character and fate. Right, exactly. So that's the premise underlying all of astrology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I called my book, the subtitle is Hellenistic Astrology, the Study of Fate and Fortune. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There were a couple other things I thought were interesting about that movie. I mean, one was just that, you know, it's interesting to see in the various movies that address fate and free will. Usually they're kind of against fate, like in the end. Like this one, fate was seen as necessary because human beings would screw things up on their own. And they said, oh, we tried free will in the past, but you guys screwed it up. And so we had to step back in. Yeah, they were trying to attribute to like, they needed to, there needed to be outside intervention. Otherwise, humans would like destroy themselves. Right. Yeah. Which you know, I can see, but um, but you know, it's still interesting to see which stories or which movies um sort of lean more towards like fate being fine versus free will really being where it's at. And mm -hmm. I think they usually go towards like free will is like better, right? More positive. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fate's usually seen. Oftentimes, there's a weird dichotomy or tension in the Western psyche where fate is sometimes seen as something like beautiful and romantic and idealized and oftentimes it can be then it's sometimes framed and even used an alternate word is substituted of like destiny yeah. like when you're destined to meet the love of your life or you're destined to 
achieve some great thing career-wise, it can be framed in that way as a positive thing. But then the other part of like the Western psyche is like the negative part of fate of seeing it as something that's being forced on you that removes your free will and that makes you like a slave or something like that or, mm -hmm. or a prisoner even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, everyone loves loves destiny but hates fate. It's just like a little twist in words. <laughs> right. Even um, though they're they're essentially the same thing, basically. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with the implication, of course, that destiny is more positive things that are fated to you, and fate isn't always. Right? Yeah. That's usually so, how people think about it. Right. Or sometimes destiny is seen as like an end thing that happens mm -hmm. at the end and is like a final point yeah. of something, whereas fate is more of like an ongoing process. I don't really know. It's all very mm -hmm. nebulous and like not well defined. Well, I think also just when people talk about destiny, it's also seen as more purposeful. And I think fate isn't always like in, in the way that people think about it. I'm not saying it, it isn't actually, but I think that people often talk about destiny as like, there's this grand purpose for me, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the big scheme of things and I'm supposed to do something, but then fate is more just like slings and arrows kind of thing. Mm. Maybe not seen as purposeful, even if that's not necessarily the case. Anyway, I thought that was interesting because, of course, the end of the movie was just like him breaking through and be breaking through the plan and like fighting it to the end. And then finally, they they change it because he demonstrated how much he was willing to use his free will. Yeah. I mean, that was the one thing I remember thinking when we first watched the movie and that was reiterated again, which is like the ending like happens very fast. Mm -hmm. And there was like something that happened in the editing where it wraps up kind of quickly, but at the end, it's just like through his perseverance and like uh, temerity to like be together, he ends up, I don't know, demonstrating their love for each other. And then they convince like God to change the plan basically to allow them to be together or to make their own fate to some extent. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. And I wondered also, um, there was this part where he wasn't supposed to get together with her because he wouldn't then not have this like gnawing emptiness to his soul that would like propel him to become president in the future. And that that was like the trade off and that like he was supposed to become the president because he would do good things, presumably for the world in that position. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then also for her, like one of the oh, an yeah. angels was threatening him that um, if you get together with her, then she'll never achieve her career goals and become a famous choreographer right. that changes the world in, in that sense. So there mm -hmm. was also an issue about like knowingness and what happens when you know your fate and that messing things up because sometimes that thing that you want maybe initially could somehow later on turn out to be not the best thing in the long run for for you or for other people. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. And in that sense, sometimes you not having the best perspective in the moment versus like a bird's eye view of like several decades down the road. Right. I had only assumed, they didn't really spell it out, but I had only assumed that at the end when they changed the plan to let them be together, that they then also got to do their respective careers as well. They right. didn't really say that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, we're kind of hoping that that was the case, but who, yeah. who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I, I assume that's the case because it was supposed to be a happy ending. Well, I mean, they showed it. That was why the ending was like so abrupt mm -hmm. and was a little too abrupt because what they showed very briefly at one point is like the notebook that showed the grid of like their fate and like where the current trajectory would take them in the future was suddenly like blank in one half. And I think they were trying to like hand wave away the sort of a notion that like suddenly they were writing their own destiny and mm -hmm. they could do what they wanted. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I thought it was interesting that they really pushed that like free will was better, kind of, or at least better in the sense that if someone individually could push through and really fight their fate, then that was like noble in some way. Right. And then there, therefore, you could change because like someone upstairs would like admire that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The other thing that I thought was interesting, there's a little quote that said um, when he ran into the the angels or the diamonds or whatever, you've just seen behind a curtain you weren't even supposed to know existed. It must be jarring. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great quote that was kind of analogous to astrology and that people oftentimes, um, when they first get into real astrology and see how much it can show about their lives and about their future, can get a little like jarred for a little bit right. and be startled because you're not usually thinking that that exists mm -hmm. until you find that. Yeah. And so it's a similar thing. There's like this underlying structure that like most people don't aren't aware of exists. And yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, that's a valid thing because that's also a sort of quasi-legitimate phenomenon of the burden of knowing one's future, being able to anticipate it would be psychologically very difficult to some extent and can be traumatic or could be um, something that's not you're not used to deal with dealing with because it's not a normal human function or like capability to mm-hmm. see the future right. and having access to any sort of foreknowledge is itself somewhat disorienting. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that actually might be a good segue into one of our next movies. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> we rewatched this last night. This is not one of your favorites, but we rewatched The Matrix from like 1999, um, written and directed by Lena and Lily Wachowski, um, head starring, of course, Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, and Carrie Ann Moss. Um, so this was like an action movie, obviously, but I think a lot of people liked it because of the heavy philosophical like undertones and discussions that actually I like I knew some part of it and had wanted to talk about it in an astrological context because I always thought it was a good analogy for astrology to some extent. But there was actually a lot more there that I had forgotten until we rewatched it last night that had to do with issues of free will and prophecy and um, things like that. Mm-hmm, right. So the main, do you have like a, a synopsis? Sure. Um, let's see. The Matrix is a 1999 science fiction action film. Um, uh, all the people in it, starring Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Hugo Weaving, Joe Pantoliano. It depicts a dystopian future in which humanity is unknowingly trapped inside a simulated reality. The Matrix, which intelligent machines have created to distract humans while using their bodies as an energy source. When computer programmer Thomas Anderson, under the hacker alias Neo, uncovers the truth, he is drawn into a rebellion against the machines along with other people who have been freed from the Matrix. That's a pretty good synopsis. It's pretty condensed. That wasn't mine, but yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so the main thing about it, though, is just the notion that um, humans entirety of humanity is like living in a simulation Mm -hmm. and they don't realize it, but that the entire simulation itself is controlled or manipulated to some extent. But I guess the big tie-in with astrology is I think astrologers often, or at least for me as an astrologer, like watch this film and think about astrology because that's kind of what astrology feels like sometimes is um, that you can see the code underlying reality and that even though we're having this experience of certain things, that there's this other underlying layer that's actually describing what what's happening in an almost like omniscient sense. Mm-hmm. Um, that when you initially get into astrology, it has a similar feeling or undertone of what does this mean about reality and why would there be this underlying code that is describing what's going on um, in reality right now and what are the implications and everything else? Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and it, and a tech, even a technical apparatus under underlying it, right? Like the code there versus the astrological technique. Yeah, because that's data. one of the oldest analogies for astrology is that astrology is a language, and even in like Mesopotamia, they talked about the heavenly writing and the stars and planets, like inscribing this language about what's happening in the past and present and future that's being sent from in their conceptualization from the gods or what have you. Um, and you know, we always have that famous image in the matrix of like this waterfall of like code and like the green code that, um, at some point they describe as what the matrix actually looks like when you're not in the simulation, that it just looks like this green language or green code that's describing people and their appearance and locations and everything else. Mm -hmm, Right. Yeah, for sure. I think the main difference, you know, that's the similarity. The difference is, I feel like the um, the implication was, you know, this movie was a lot darker and more dystopian, and so the implication is more like that it's bad that you're imagining this reality because it's not real, mm. rather than it merely more neutrally describing the world that you're living in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we talked about afterwards that it's actually similar to like the ancient, like Gnostic view mm-hmm. that everyone, we are all these like sparks of divinity that got stuck in this material world that was created by these archons or these gatekeepers 
and that the point is to keep us stuck here in this like darkness of the material world. Um, but some of that notion in Gnosticism incorporated astrological elements, but it turned it on its head because then like the planets become these gatekeepers that are helping to keep us enmeshed in the physical realm. And so there's this like Gnostic component almost that's in the, the matrix where the overlords or the gods or the creators are these malevolent like beings that don't necessarily have positive intentions for us. Yeah, exactly. And are trying to keep us trapped here for some reason. But again, that's like a theme that goes very far back in philosophy and in some religions that's sort of weaved in different ways in Western society. Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting to notice that philosophy underlying the movie um, or that parallel. I don't feel like most astrologers, of course, feel that way about the fact that you can describe the sort of underlying reality doesn't necessarily mean it's bad that you're enmeshed in it. You mm -hmm. know, I think that would be the the um, the difference. There. Yeah, I mean, um, definitely. I mean, most astrologers have a much more positive view of astrology and stuff and what you can do with it. I mean, I'm sure. There were, or there's still elements of that. Like there were Gnostic cults that like incorporated astrology mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, but that is like a still it's a debate even now in like philosophy or in not science fiction, but in science circles of like, are we living in a in a, a in sort a simulation. of a simulation? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the was the possibility of that and what would that look like? Or how would you know if you were? Mm -hmm. Um it, it would be sort of difficult, or what signs would you look for? And and when that discussion never always comes up in scientific circles, that's one of the things I always think about is like astrology. Is like, well, mm. if if you actually stumble look upon like a code that actually seems to be describing what's happening in reality on m multiple different levels, then that would actually be really good um, evidence potentially for where that could be like one of the conclusions that that could be drawn from that. Yeah, for sure. And some astrologers, you know, do talk about using astrology in order to free yourself more from like what you would otherwise do on you know, automatic pilot kind of thing. Right. Um so there is some element to that. Yeah, that the idea that if you do the default like then you will fulfill this like astrological placement in a expected manner, mm -hmm. but that the awareness of that and the sudden realization that that's what you're coded to do in some sense itself um going back to the like jarring experience that we were talking about in the previous movie the notion of suddenly becoming aware of the underlying like matrix or code underlying reality that is describing even your own actions and tendencies mm -hmm. um the awareness of that in and of itself can sometimes offset what you might normally do right yeah, for sure. So that is the similarity there. Um, there was also the element of prophecy that you were talking about that you had forgotten since last time. Yeah, like they did that. Like the whole first movie was done really well, and like the second and third movies were universally not received as well as the um, first one because the first one is really interesting, like world building, and it's like edited really well, and it has like amazing like music and sci-fi and action, but also philosophy and other things. Um, yeah, but one of the elements I forgot that's really heavy in the last third of the movie is this whole notion of prophecy and like going to see the oracle who um, is able to like know the future, both in the short term and the long term, mm. and some of the implications of that in terms of choice and decisions and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that she told Neo that he wasn't the one, mm -hmm. and that that you know part of how that was talked about was that she told him what he needed to hear at the time to continue on his path rather than telling him the full story and the full future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um that is an interesting concept in terms of like the role of divination or the role of diviners and of predictions and prophecies and sometimes some of the historical themes about um self-fulfilling prophecies and things like that mm -hmm. and and the diviner being involved in creating the circumstance that leads to the predicted outcome. Right. Yeah, and even the first time he meets the oracle, there's something said really quick about when he breaks the vase and she's like, "No, but you know, if I had told you beforehand, something about that." Yeah, she says what well, you're what's really going to uh you're really going to struggle with afterwards if is if I hadn't told you 
don't worry about the vase if you still would have broken mm-hmm. it because that's what causes him to turn and knock it over. Right. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in terms of that. But so I guess with you know that's a whole side thing, and then that goes in other weird directions in the second and third movies um, that we don't have to get into. But it was just interesting how much they were incorporating some of those different themes or themes having to do with prophecy in a modern sort of context. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else about that movie that we meant to touch on or mention? That's all I can think of. I mean, I think the the major thing is just like, you know, reality is different than what you actually think or what you see. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And then what are the implications of that? Mm-hmm. What are the implications of any sort of like external descriptive um, system that seems to be describing what's going on rea- in reality, but not necessarily like, like causing it, mm-hmm. which is one of the weird things about astrology, especially if you're viewing it in a more archetypal or synchronistic context that just like the, the classic analogy is just like a clock on the wall is describing that it's nine o'clock at night right. without necessarily causing it, um, that astrology might be describing what's happening right now in reality or in your life personally as well as universally without necessarily being the cause of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a good analogy and way to approach starting to understand how astrology works as a, a system. Right. Yeah. All right. Was there a connected movie with that that's like relevant or what would be a good transition point here? Um, let's see. I mean, well, this, this was one of our-, our Yeah, that's one. the next one here. Okay. So one of the other ones, movies that we re-watched, re-watched recently um, was Slumdog Millionaire from 2008. It was directed by Danny Boyle. Um, so this was a movie that focused very much, again, on concepts of like fate and destiny and the notion of things being predetermined, especially in like the ultimate- Ending point and outcome, mm-hmm. and this phrase that kept kept using throughout the film is this notion of like it was written, right? And the implication being of what was written was like one's fate or one's destiny, right? Yeah. Should I do the synopsis? Sure. Okay, so it's about an 18 year old from the slums of Mumbai. Um, so he was basically not formally educated. He had like a low level job. Um, delivering tea to a call center, and it says as a contestant on this game show, um, who Indian version of who wants to be a millionaire, Jamal surprises everyone by being able to answer every question correctly. Accused of cheating, Jamal recounts his life story to the police, uh, illustrating how he is able to answer each question correctly. And so it basically goes through like every specific um, anecdote in his life, every specific incident that describes how he knew the answer to that particular question. Right. And in flashbacks. Yeah. So the premise is that. He goes on this game show and he's able to get every answer correct, even though he shouldn't know all those answers, just because he had had really unique life experiences um, that actually taught him the answer to each of those questions leading up to this final uh, pivotal event in his life. Right. And um, yeah, and I really liked that concept because there's a level of that happening with astrology and with the concept of fate as well. If you pay attention to people's lives sometimes, if sometimes Events in a person's life do end up um, teaching them things that are unique that sometimes put them in a unique circumstance that other people might not be able to handle or figure out how to deal with. But for some real weird reason, they sometimes are the right person that is in the right place at the right time to do that certain thing. Exactly. And if you usually, if you can look at the astrological features of like what's going on then and what's going on in their birth chart, like you can see those connections, Hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so, what were the other like main things about that? Did you write any notes? Um, I mean, honestly, that was even as it was a nice long movie. I mean, that was really the main point. Was like, is fate happening here? You know, because that was right in the first scene. You know, there were four possible answers for why he got the answers. Why he got the answers to the questions correct? Right. And number four was it is written, so it is fated. Um, and so the whole thing was just kind of about that. About like, was he? Was that what was going on? Was he in the right place at the right time? Particularly, even though many of the experiences were overtly negative, but they yeah. somehow led him to still know these things that ended up like really good in the end, at least in one way. 
Yeah, and I forgot one of the things was that a lot of them oftentimes were like hardships, mm -hmm. and it was an issue also about um, different classes and the class system um, in in the world in general and in different parts of the world, and how that can sometimes limit people that are born in certain social classes. That if you're born in a lo lower social class, that you don't have as much freedom of choice or like upward mobility as somebody that's born in the middle or the upper class, mm -hmm. which is a theme we'll come back to later in one of the other movies. Right. But that was one of the other underlying implications here as well is like how much um, choice you have mm -hmm. depending on the circumstances you're born into. Right. And also kind of like then the idea that like only fate could really override that in a sort of very special instance. Right. Um, but yeah, but sometimes that that does happen. Um, as well as, you know, it's also like a sort of love story mm -hmm. and about the, again, just the, like the, the drive that um, two people had to be together or that one person had for the other to pursue them and try, try to overcome the things that were um, necessary that were trying to keep them apart as an exercise in free will or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right, for sure. Because it seemed quite hopeless that he would ever find her again, much less multiple times. Right. Um, yeah, so different elements of like chance and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Chance, but then also acting on those little opportunities, like when he was in the call center and was sitting down in someone's seat for a few minutes, and he suddenly like looks up all the people with his brother's name, and there aren't that many, and he starts calling them. That, that kind of like intersection of like, you have this very small chance, right. and then, but you have the free, maybe the free will to act on that chance. Yeah, because he kept trying like over and over again repeatedly, and he never stopped trying to achieve that thing that he wanted, mm -hmm. right? Which is very similar to the um, the first movie we were talking about, the um, Adjustment Bureau. Yeah, so maybe that's one of the underlying themes, and that's an issue with astrology is um, it being really hard to know sometimes, like when the answer is um, to keep pushing and keep trying to overcome something, and when something is like a surmountable difficulty mm. versus when something is a, is a roadblock that's telling you no in some area where you can't proceed further. Right. And having experiences with both is really important, and sometimes, especially in metaphysical circles, can get too, too skewed in one extreme or another. Right. There's like one extreme which is like fatalism and like being told you can't do something and therefore just giving up and not um, continuing to attempt to persevere or overcome that, but instead um, accepting one's fate and not trying mm -hmm. versus the other extreme is sometimes the notion that like you can manifest anything you want and there's things like the secret and the idea that you can literally like whatever you put your mind to you can accomplish mm -hmm. which is also in its extreme manifestation just like not true um, because we all have experiences on either end of that spectrum of um, you know sometimes having to run into an end point where you can't proceed further with something versus on the other hand sometimes needing to just um, through great striving and perseverance, being able to achieve something that you really want. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. It reminds me of like debates over Saturnian principles. You know, like when is Saturn a wall saying no? And when is it just a test that you have to persevere, which is also a Saturnian principle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Let's see. So, what else about this movie? I mean, it had a really great soundtrack, is the thing that I'm always left with. <laughs> Yeah. 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 There was that one um, MIA. Is it MIA? Yeah. Um, like she collaborated song. with like the main composer um, mm -hmm. and it just had this amazing soundtrack. I think it might have won like an Academy Award for that because it got a bunch of nominations that year in 2008. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I felt like some of the answers he would have um, known, he didn't actually have to have a um, specific ex life experience around. But of course, cinematically, they had to show each one. Right. Um, you know, there were a few where. Like he would have known anyway, but <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, so that was a pretty good movie and one that brings up some interesting themes. There might be like others that we're forgetting, but I think that's like the main stuff. Mm -hmm. um, which one do you want to transition into now? I guess um, there was one about when it comes to social mobility. Like this uh -huh. would be a good one. Sure. Okay. All right. So the next one is the Up series. That started with was the first one titled Seven Up. Seven Up, yeah. And that was in 1964. Mm -hmm. So this is like a series. And do you have a synopsis? Sure. Um, 
The Up series of documentary films follows the lives of 10 males and four females in England beginning in 1964 when they were seven years old. The first film was titled Seven Up, with later films adjusting the number in the title to match the age of the subjects at the time of filming. The documentary has nine episodes, one every seven years, thus spanning 56 years. Um, 28 Up was chosen for Roger Ebert's list of 10 greatest films of all time. Um, the children were selected for the original program to represent the range of socioeconomic backgrounds in Britain at that time with the expectation that each child's social class would determine their future. So the series started much more focused on that, on like social class and kind of trying to prove or disprove that social class was still the major determinant of people's futures. Yeah. So it started in the UK and they got together a group of children that were all seven years old and they interviewed them and asked them about their life and their aspirations, their future, and different things like that. And then every seven years, um, this director would like film another roughly like hour and a half or two hour documentary where we'd go back and re-interview the kids um, first at 14. And then there was another at like 21 mm -hmm. and then 28 and it kept going. And of course, like some of those early ones, since they were doing them in seven year increments, are really interesting astrologically because those are also like Saturn hard angles right. of like the first Saturn square and then the Saturn opposition and then the waning square and then the Saturn return. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can track it from that direction. And all of them were born in 1956 or so, right? Well, give or take. Uh, it was right around the time that Saturn was in between the end of Scorpio and the beginning of Sag. Mm. So I was often like watching their life stories, trying to guess which one they were. Like some of them seem pretty evident, which one? Yeah, because yeah. they were all born within a year of each other. So mm -hmm. they all had Saturn in one sign or another. Right. And sometimes that came out very dramatically in some of their lives. Um, and I'm surprised nobody, I mean, I assume at some point, like somebody hidden in some journal, we haven't been able to find any websites when anybody got birth data for most of them but mm -hmm. i'm sure like in some obscure like british journal or something that some astrologer has like gotten some birth times for some of the people at some yeah, point yeah i wonder it'd be great to look at their actual charts but you know i really love this series i mean i like documentaries anyway as you know mm -hmm. um but you know of course every 7 years just makes your ears perk up if you're an astrologer because of that Saturn cycle you were mentioning. One a little frustrating piece about that though is that since they were filming at the beginning of that time, age 7, 14, 21, etc., I tend to think or guess that they probably hit at the beginning of those Saturn transits and so much of like the major stuff that was happening probably for those transits for them hadn't quite happened yet because you often hear in some of the movies like what's happened since which sounds more like the main events. Yeah, some of the stuff in some of the years w happened like one or two years later because they hadn't finished like their Saturn returns yet by the mm -hmm. time they caught up with them at 28. Exactly. Although, even so, sometimes you can see some interesting things. And then some of the ones with the years ended up overlapping with other transits, like 42 was one. Mm -hmm. And that's one of your favorites because that's also the Uranus opposition. Right. Yeah, it can just be striking sometimes. And so you could, that was actually really cool to kind of hear little things come out if you know astrology and know the ages that should be important like that and be like, oh, they suddenly left something that they've been doing up until this point. Well, of course they did. They're in their midlife transits, you know, right. things like that. Yeah. So it's like there's that transit element, but then also, the director, Michael Apted, who actually became like a famous director and directed a bunch of other big films um, later on in his career. And it's, so it's kind of interesting that he also had this like ongoing series. Um, the last one that they filmed, which just came out in 2019, was 63 Up, mm -hmm. which we'd been trying to see like for the past couple of years, but yeah. was like weirdly not available. And we just found out a, a place to stream it literally like two days ago. Right. Yeah. For quite a while, they were only releasing it to theaters. But then, of course, the pandemic hit. And I was like, no, you just have to stream it. Like, it's not right. happening here. <laughs> and that sucked because we had watched 56 up like several years back. So we've mm -hmm. been looking forward to the installment of 63. Right. Um, yeah. So we just got a chance to see that. And it's a little depressing at this point. Like, the last one was a little depressing because now everyone's getting like much older and like there's, some people, for example, the director just passed away, mm -hmm. I think, in the past what, year, year, year and a half, year or so. Yeah. So there's a question about whether the series will even continue because the next installment should be at 70, 70. when all of the kids are up to 70. Um, and some of the participants either passed away or not doing it very well either. Mm -hmm. um, but 
one of the interesting premises that they introduced right from the start was they said something like, show me uh, a child at seven, seven and I'll show you the adult mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, give me a child till seven and I will show you the man. I think it's a Jesuit saying, mm -hmm. which is really more about formation. But in this case, they were treating it slightly differently, which is like, you know, let's just see them at seven where they've come up to at this point and we can see going forward. Um, and I actually found some great quotes from Roger Ebert's review um, of 28 Up in 1986, which is really relevant to the astrological discussion. And of course, he's not referencing astrology at all. But he says, if we can see so clearly how these children become these adults, was it just as obvious in our own cases? Do we even now contain with us our personal, our own personal destinies for the next seven years? Is change possible? Is the scenario already written? And then later on in the review, he says, I look forward to the next edition of this film when its subjects are 35. I have hope for some, fear for others. It is almost scary to realize that this film has given me a fair chance of predicting what lies ahead for these strangers. And I thought those were really great quotes because, of course, he wasn't talking about astrology at all, but it's very similar to what we do discuss in astrology. And basically, it's just like if you, if you watch these people over time, their personalities are such that they're moving in a certain direction. Um, their actions or experiences up to this point have either set them up or not for future experiences and so forth. Right. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a pretty cool uh, quote from that review. And, you know, what I really liked about this movie series is that it was supposed to test the class structure at first. That's how that was the genesis, but then it became much more existential and just kind of about human nature and human life, right? It was. Um, following all these kind of everyday people over time, you know, over their, the co course of their whole lives. And I really like that because that's what you do in astrology as well for most people if they're consulting astrologers, mm -hmm. is you're, you know, you're talking to people about their lives, not famous people necessarily, just everyday people. And you have to kind of care about like everyday people's lives, you know, mm -hmm. and be interested in how that goes. Um, and I thought that was interesting as well, even apart from the astrology. I didn't think 63 Up was quite as depressing as maybe you felt, <laughs> um, but I think we've seen that trend with a few movies <laughs> lately. Um, but I found it really interesting on the human existential level, you know, watching them kind of mellow out over time and the, the pieces that you also run into if you're a consulting astrologer of just like life stages mm -hmm. um, and how people often change on average over time. Um, and I thought it was cool that, you know, most of them seemed relatively at peace with how their lives had gone up to this point. They were a little bit more content in terms of like, well, this is possible. This isn't possible. This is how it's gone. It's fine. You know, right. not maybe 100 percent of the time, but um, to a large degree. And I think you see that, too, when you are consulting with people of different ages. They have different concerns going on oftentimes on average. Right. You know, building a career versus, you know, in 63 Up, they had a ton of grandchildren. They were talking about the grandchildren and, right. you know. Yeah, their children at different stages. And when they had children, and some had children relatively early and some had them rather late. Mm -hmm. And then some had like no grandkids or like one. And then some had like a ton of grandkids mm -hmm. and how that changed things. Um, but I mean, the big thing that they kept coming back to also was just the notion of, to what extent is your personality, how early is that really formed in life, mm -hmm. and how much is a person's early personality really consistent and largely the same the older you get versus how much do life experiences change or inform that in different ways? Mm -hmm. And um, like, I don't know what the end result was because they were asking all of them that, and it seemed like a lot of them thought subjectively they all felt like that they were largely still the same as they were at seven on some level, personality-wise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. M most of them said more or less, yes, I can see the child that I was in who I am now still. Mm -hmm. And some of them said, but I think one in particular said, but of course, then you have all these life experiences and those life experiences change you too. Right. And I think that's true. And it reminds me a bit of, you know, like the birth chart versus like ongoing timing in people's lives. And how like the birth chart, you know, like a common sort of uninformed critique of astrology is like, oh, well, it's just static, you know, it's kind of, it's very like boxing you in. But um, but there's the natal chart, but then there's also the ongoing timing, which is your life experiences. Right. And those do inform who you are going forward after that. And so Yeah. yeah. And that that does change things. And one of our next ones that we'll talk about gets into that even more. Um 
but yeah, that notion of how of like nature versus nurture and mm-hmm. how much our uh, inborn traits and characteristics are there and pretty fixed from the beginning or mm-hmm. from pretty early in the life versus how much are we molded and shaped in different ways by our, our upbringing and our surroundings or in this instance it's, they focused a lot on like the stratification of like the British class system mm-hmm. especially in the 1950s and 60s right um, and even if that's mellowed out a little bit maybe to some extent um, that's still in some ways the early education and opportunities people had for education setting them up on different paths relatively early on for sure yeah yeah and it was really interesting if you've watched all of them you know just to see it, their personalities go through i think there was only one that was like really different markedly different than like they were when they were younger yeah like there was one that struggled with like some mental health issues and was really um mysterious for a lot of the series because he was a really like optimistic um thoughtful sort of uh child at like 7 and 14 mm-hmm. but then like at 21 like his personality changed like really dramatically and there was something a ar- clearly like awry by 21 mm-hmm. where things had gone weird and it wasn't clear what had happened and then right. that sort of grows and develops and gets a little worse by 28 mm-hmm. and then we're not really sure where it's going for a number of years there. And then it kind of ended in a more ambiguous space, I think, in this last one than uh, we were anticipating because it was kind of like worrying to see if that was going to go downhill further. But it mm. seemed like it had mellowed out like a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And, you know, I found myself like cheering for him, like the successes that he did have, even mm-hmm. if it was more limited than some of the other people. Right. Um, and also guessing at like what that birth chart looked like or what those events looked like. Cause clearly something happened and you would see that in timing if you had someone's chart. Right. You know, um, yeah. Uh, he had like an eerie thing too when they interviewed him when he was like seven. I think it was when he was seven. He was talking about like walking around and not have any, having anywhere to go. There were just like, there were occasional even like statements that the kids would make in the first movie that were oddly tied into like things later. And I think that that is a piece of that, like you are who you are, you know, even early on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, what were some of, I mean, there's different life stage stuff, just seeing a person and that's the ultimate like triumph of the entire series is it's like literally some of these people have been interviewed every seven years and you can see if you watch the entire series which like early on when you first found it had you already seen parts of it i would seen some of them yeah okay so we were we rock you showed me like almost the entire series and then we later watched the most recent two so if you watch them in quick quick succession you see these people like grow up in front of your eyes and it's really interesting in terms of the just the whole um you know like a seed versus what a plant grows into and Mm -hmm. and that trajectory and seeing a person um, grow from their initial trajectory into like a full person but there's still being a lot of commonality um, throughout that but you still get to see them grow and develop in time Mm -hmm. yeah 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 Yeah. i'm trying to think if there's anything else about that um i just really like this series (laughs) yeah it's really good i hope you're a little skeptical about whether it's going to be over i hope somebody even though the primary um, director Michael Apted has passed away. Like I hope somebody steps in in order to do the next one when it's time in like what's five or six years. Yeah, when everybody is seventy to continue the project. I just actually read a- another article the other day, and it was saying that the director, you know, while he was still alive, he was at a Q and A at a showing, and and um, someone asked about that, and he pointed to this person who was like part of the directing team for a, a long time, and he's like, "Well, I guess she could do it, mm. and um, she may actually." Okay, so yeah, I mean that would make sense to me because he's been doing it; it's been around forever. So there must yeah. have been other people that have also been involved in it for years as well. Yeah, I I think she had been involved in a long for although she said she's in her seventies as well, so you know it's a matter of she was like maybe they'll need to take us around in wheelchairs by then, but I'll do it if I can. Right. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it was also interesting, like you're saying, just seeing different stages of like career aspirations, and there was one that had really big aspirations to get into like nuclear fusion mm-hmm. and you can see him when he was like at his Saturn return being very optimistic about that and wanting to change the world but then late in later years 
feeling like that was a dead end and it wasn't like a good choice in some sense or that it, w- it wasn't able to do what he wanted to accomplish there mm-hmm. and so ended up changing course or focusing on something else or you know some of them the changing course was like having children and how yeah. much that became the focus and passion in their life in different ways right there were a couple that were like er- interviewed earlier on and they were like no i'm not interested in having children and then right. at 28 they're like here are my children right <laughs> um and then there's one, the one that kind of had the hardest life path. He, you could see him bottoming out around 28, which you would sort of expect if someone was having a hard Saturn return. Mm. Um, and then he sort of gradually went up from there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, it's just a good meditation on it. makes me think of the some of the discussion I was having months ago about um, time and the notion of time being like a fourth dimension mm. and to what extent... Um, Time or all of time is happening simultaneously, but but we only experience it in slices from like moment to moment. Mm. But that there's actually like this um, continuity where if you're able to step out of time and view it objectively, that um, each of us has a life and like a starting point. But then it's sort of like a, a snake in time that that grows and develops and matures into your full adulthood, and then eventually. Goes until the end of your life, and then is cut off. And we're experiencing those, experiencing those as slices of time, mm. which interestingly is is exactly what a birth chart represents, right, because right. it's a two dimensional snapshot of time. But it's also the planets keep moving after that point. So if you think about it, it's really cutting just a little slice of time and then freezing it, just a part of it there, when in fact it's part of some longer continuous thing that is a continuous moment. Mm-hmm, for sure. It reminds me, as we were talking about that, it reminds me of the concentric circles in tree trunks. Hmm. Uh, it's kind of like we're trees, you know, because you like you start at the beginning and there is a seed, right? Like and um and then the you know there's the young part where you can see kind of the seeds of what will be and what will grow further. And then it just kind of concentric rings where, you know, you're not revisiting exactly who you are, but it's sort of flowering out from that point in a circle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the birth chart is like a seed because then it sets certain things in motion that will then like grow and develop into full plants or a full tree later on that has Mm -hmm. different characteristics and different branches or is missing branches um, or different things like that. But Mm -hmm. a series like this where you can see several individuals grow and develop from being small children to um, adults to old age is probably like the closest experience that we can ever have as humans to like seeing the totality of that um, long moment in time stretched out of a person's life in its totality rather than just in slices. Right, exactly. Because all of this, you've got all of the slices and seven year increments like lined up here, mm-hmm. and you can sort of see the full. Sort of a time lapse of a tree growing and then sprouting and then eventually like wilting and passing away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. In a way that you don't frequently get to see unless you know someone your whole life, like if you've had friends that you've had since you were a child or something like that. Right. But many of us don't see that many people throughout their whole lifespan rather than just like little slices here and there. Yeah. Well, or even ch- children, like if you raise children, right. like you see that. But the problem is that. Because it happens so slowly and so gradually, you don't actually see it as much because it's you're part of that continuous process, mm-hmm. and it actually is that experience is much more visceral if you you're somebody that leaves and comes back, um, then you see it like much more because it's not as as gradual. Right. I think there was someone in there that even answered a question like that. It was something like, "Well, you don't really notice, you know, when you're, when it's all gradual like that, and you're in this experience yourself." Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's just a bunch of interesting things in that movie for astrologers to think about in terms of, um, yeah, that seed potentiality thing or the potentiality and the birth chart and its relationship to that, mm-hmm. the nature versus nurture thing, and then also the critical turning points and transits of different astrological cycles and the times when a person's life can change some, somewhat dramatically mm-hmm. and when different. Themes can either start or can stop in different areas, Mm -hmm. um, becoming important parts of a person's life. Right, for sure. Yeah. And in this last one, 63 up, we could look back. You know, they did the previous one at 56. So it would have been just at the beginning, if that, 
of some people's Saturn returns and some may not have been into that yet. Mm. Um, and so you could hear in the recollections, like, oh, this happened four years ago. This happened five years ago, you know? Mm. And you could kind of kind of place like what happened at different people's second Saturn returns. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what you do in an astrological consultation usually as part of it is um, the astrologer having to get used to the person's life. And one of the biggest keys to prediction in astrology is that if you can figure out the trajectory of a person's past and what um, astrological cycles were tied into the crucial moments of that, then you can anticipate and project that out into the future and um, do a pretty good job of, of predicting the future by just um, carrying through that trajectory. Mm -hmm, for sure. Which is why I love that Roger Ebert quote that I found because, you know, I'm sure he wasn't thinking about astrology at all, but, you know, and it's things that we think about all the time as astrologers, but people don't otherwise often do, I don't think. Um, you know, it was almost sounded like a strange realization that, like, if you did watch this progression, like, you could predict what would happen next, you know, most likely for the different people. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so I think that's a good transition into our next movie, which is one that you found recently, mm -hmm. titled Three Identical Strangers, which is actually a documentary that came out in 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the synopsis is that um, it's about the lives of these three guys, a set of I identical triplets adopted as infants by separate families. Um, and it recounts how they discovered each other by chance at age 19 how that ensued, um, their experiences together, and then them finding out that they'd been part of an undisclosed scientific nature versus nurture study, psychological study um, of putting different siblings who are genetically identical in differing socioeconomic circumstances and family upbringings to see if they would be really similar to each other despite their environments or if they would be very different because of their upbringings. Yeah. And um Again, it's this is like outlined kind of dramatically, so we're kind of ruining it for people yeah. in terms of some of the like re reveal of the film. But like we said at the beginning, um, spoilers. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can talk about it though. Now that we've said that, like yeah. with all the details. But so the premise is that initially there's this guy that goes to college when he's 19, and he gets to campus, and everybody seems to recognize him, and he doesn't understand why. Mm -hmm. And then right away, um, this other guy comes up to him and says, "You look." He realizes he says, "You look exactly like my friend, what Dave or something like that." Eddie. Eddie. Mm -hmm. And um, they call Eddie, and very quickly realize that they are twins that were separated at birth, mm -hmm. that they didn't know about each other, and they were both adopted into different families. Right. And then a newspaper runs the story, and then somebody's like reading. The newspaper, and they realize that these two twins actually look like this third guy that they know. Yeah. And then it turns out that they were actually triplets that were separated at birth, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. And then it focuses on how the three of them became celebrities and eventually um, very quickly became friends and have some similar mannerisms and stuff, mm -hmm. um, even though they were separated at birth from that just genetic inheritance, evidently. Mm -hmm. But then um, later, it sort of becomes darker when it turns out that they were deliberately separated at birth as part of this scientific experiment in order to, and they were placed in like one was placed in like a more blue collar family, and one was placed in a more middle class family, and one was placed in a more upper class family mm -hmm. by this um, like psychiatrist who in the 1960s wanted to run a test to see like how that would affect things. Right. But they were um, upset about it because they all felt like that breaking up their family, may, both a like robbed them of having that f family or sibling relationship together, but also may have caused them like psychological harm and stress mm -hmm. um, because they may have all uh, experienced like separation anxiety or there were indications that they experienced separation anxiety from splitting them up right. early on. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were just upset, of course, on principle that this shouldn't have been done um, unknowingly right. to them. That it's like they're being experimented on, like like lab rats. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but also, like all of them apparently had, you know, maladaptive behaviors as infants. They would like hit their heads on their cribs and things like that, and mm -hmm. seemed like they had some trauma responses going on. So, um, which you know had later ramifications as well. And you know, as they got older. Um, 
So one of the things I thought was really interesting is that the, they did get a hold of a, the researcher's past assistant. <clears throat> Part of the issue was that these were never, um, the study was never published and it was sealed. Oh, it was sealed at Yale University. Yeah. Until like 2066. In like the 19, early 1960s when this was started, um, there was a lot more like psycholo psychology was a little bit more like the Wild West, and there was mm -hmm. a lot more stuff that was viewed as like ethical then or as like not a problem that mm -hmm. today or later would be viewed as ethically irresponsible or terrible or, or what have you. Yeah, exactly. So they didn't get a hold of a lot of people who are willing to talk on film about it. They got a hold of two. Um, one of them was the researcher's past assistant, um, and she was claiming that. Uh, she she didn't actually she didn't seem that sympathetic about the you know the ramifications to the kids honestly she seemed more like in between um, but she she was claiming that the study came out more strongly in favor of nature and I thought there was this interesting statement that she was like but people don't like that right they don't want to think they have that little free will um, and I thought that was an interesting little astrological tie in there yeah well because that was the point of the study it was that in the 1960s it was much more of a major psychological question of whether a person's genetic nature was determinative of their future and like their character or whether a person's upbringing like their how they how they were nurtured or up, upbringing by their family how much that affected things mm -hmm. and so this was supposed to be a test of that um, but we saw sort of elements of both it seemed like came mm -hmm. came out during the course of the documentary Right, yeah. And so there's actually birth times in Astro Data Bank for these triplets, which is interesting. They all end up having the same rising sign. And so virtually the same chart, slightly different degrees on some things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ascendant and the midheaven. But so that's interesting as well because, you know, this ties in in a couple different ways to astrological things. Um, one is, of course, what do you do with twins or with multiple births? Um, especially if they have a really similar chart, mm -hmm. um, because they're still different people, you know, in some ways, even if they have very similar, um, you know, like lots of striking similarities as well, which I think was shown in this film. They were all kind of emphasizing how they had the same mannerisms, they had the same preferences in many areas of life. Um, you know, they would sort of almost mirror each other in, in how they would move their bodies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of this is like the genetics, but some of it's also like they have the, almost the exact same chart astrologically, right? Right. Um, so there's two different things going on. Um, but then they kind of got into later, like, well, they had different families, they had different upbringings, um, and that, you know, seemed to have affected them a little bit differently, each of them. Yeah. And they were definitely emphasizing the similarities much more earlier on and then mm -hmm. in the first half of the documentary, and then later in the second half got into more of their differences. And it's hard always with documentaries because it's like a lot of what your perception of the viewer and your opinion is formed by what the director's opinion is and the way that mm -hmm. they shoot and, and edit and present mm -hmm. the film very much will you know lead your opinion in a certain direction so right. it's like I sometimes am hesitant so I don't always know the documentaries and stuff like that when they do have a specific narrative that they're um, pushing like if you would have the same conclusion yourself, or mm. if there's anything that you're not seeing or not understanding. But for sure, yeah, there were elements of both of like, you know, very close similarities between the three of them, but then also um, differences. And one of the things they really emphasized was just how um, one of them or two of them had pretty strong um, upbringings, pretty um, supportive upbringings in terms of their adopted families, mm. whereas one of them had a much more um, uh, stern or like strict or authoritarian father figure and as his mm. adopted father and he ended up not doing as well later on in life and at least the documentary and some of the people interviewed were trying to say that that may have been a contributing factor to some of the stuff that happened later on for him mm -hmm. yeah and you know I don't know if you want to look at charts now or you want to wait a minute but um there is an interesting little tie-in in terms of those differences in their specific charts with the birth times. Yeah, so according to Astro Data Bank, which one was the earliest? It was Bob. Bob was 1.04 a.m. Okay. Bob Shafrin. Okay, so here's the chart. And this was in the like 
um, Astro Data Bank source notes, it sounded like an astrologer wrote to them asking for their birth data. I'm not sure what the letter was about, but it's citing a letter from one of the triplets and who mentioned all of the times in the letter. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the birth chart of then the first triplet, and they were born several minutes apart. Mm -hmm. So the birth chart for those listening to the audio version, it has six degrees of Taurus rising. And um, the ruler of the ascendant is Venus, which is at five degrees of Gemini, which you liked because, like, the ruler right. of the ascendant is in the sign of the twins, which is sometimes sign when there's like multiples or like more than one of something. Mm -hmm, right. One of the what the ancient astrologers would call the double bodied signs. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, then there's a little stellium in Cancer with Mercury, which is interesting because, of course, with Taurus rising, Cancer is the third whole sign house. Mm -hmm. um, so Mercury is at one degree of Cancer, the Moon is at 13 Cancer, and the Sun is at 19 Cancer, and the degree of the IC for the first of the triplets, Bob, is at 20 degrees of Cancer. Mm -hmm. And then those are all opposed Saturn in Capricorn at 27 Capricorn in the ninth house, which is about, in this first birth chart, um, about seven degrees off of the midheaven at 20 Capricorn. Right. Um, so quickly, other than that, it's like Jupiter is at three Aquarius in the tenth whole sign house. Uranus is at twenty three Leo in the fourth whole sign house, conjunct the North Node at twenty seven Leo. Um, there's a Mars Pluto conjunction with Pluto at six Virgo and Mars at seven Virgo in the fifth whole sign house. Neptune is up on the Descendant at eight degrees of Scorpio in the seventh whole sign house. And I guess that's it. Besides the South Node at twenty-seven Aquarius, mm. and Uranus, it doesn't. It's not obvious from this chart, but is about ten days from stationing in the fourth whole sign house conjunct the North Node in Leo. Okay, which I think is very apt in terms of their separation from their birth mother and also separation from each other eventually. Yeah, um, I love that Stellium, especially the two luminaries in the third house, oppose Saturn in an night chart in the ninth. You know, I don't love, of course, in terms of the effects of that, but it just so perfectly describes like their that siblings is like a strong feature of their life, mm -hmm. um, each of their lives, um, with both luminaries and the the moon in its own sign ruling the third house of siblings. But then those are opposed and actually applying opposed Saturn in a night chart was the more challenging um uh, Saturn placement in in the ninth house close to the midheaven. And I think that's the separation. Saturn is often about separation. Um, I also love in a sort of astrologer good way, not in a you know actual humanistic way, um, that kind of the villains in this story are academics. It's academia, the you know, the rec and that's a ninth house thing with Saturn there. Um, so the records are sealed at Yale. They wanted to get the records. They have actually gotten some of the records as a result of this film, but they're heavily redacted still. So yeah. I still didn't give them a lot of answers. Yeah, like so scientist and it was done for a scientific or theoretically an academic study, right. which we might associate with the ninth house, which is usually like education and higher education and college. And it's interesting, mm -hmm. some of the photos of the kids from early on are like being photographed, um, you know, having them do tests and like mm. putting um, blocks in like different holes and things like that to mm. study their reflexes and IQ and other things like that. Right. Um, yeah, so that was one of the things you were focusing on is just having the stellium in the third house of siblings of the sun, the moon, and Mercury, but then having Saturn in a night chart opposing that stellium mm -hmm. and the separation and the breakup of of their you know triplet family unit very right. early on. Right, and the separation was from like intellectuals basically. Right. Um. So that's really interesting. The Uranus. Almost stationing is interesting in the fourth. Um, so a few other interesting things, but those were the more striking ones. Yeah. So um, I just redid the like thumbnail because I had a terrible thumbnail for. I've, I did an episode on twins with mm -hmm. um, Adam Ellenboss years ago. It was actually a really good discussion about the issue of twins in astrology. Mm -hmm. So you can find that on YouTube. I think it's titled um, "Twins in Astrology" or something like that. I forget what episode it is, but this is a good. Example and application of some of the principles that we talked about of that goes back to ancient astrology that have been talked about by astrologers for a long time, which is there was an astrologer from like the first century or so who, when posed the issue of twins by like a skeptic of astrology, he supposedly took a potter's wheel and put 
um, a piece of clay on it and made a pot and then spun it really quickly, the, the pot, and then he struck it twice in rapid succession in the same place while it was spinning with a stick mm. um, in seeming the, the, the same place. But then when it slowed down um, and stopped, those two taps that were given to it in the same place were actually like pretty far apart on the actual vase because of how fast it was spinning. Mm -hmm. And this was used as like an analogy of what happens in astrology that sometimes even two people that are born seemingly very close together or in quick succession, um, there can be notable changes in their birth chart due to how quickly the degrees of the angles like the ascendant and midheaven and icy and descendant actually move over the matter of just a few minutes. Right. Yeah, and I think that's actually one of the interesting things here, in fact. So this is 104. The two others, you know, they're born within a half hour of each other. So the second one's 115. Okay, so this is the first one is Bob, and he's mm -hmm. got the ascendant at what? Six, 639 Taurus, and midheaven at 20 and a half Capricorn. Okay, and then the middle one is Dave? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then he has the ascendant at 1044 Taurus, four more degrees further, um, and the midheaven at 23 Capricorn, which is now four degrees from Saturn. And how many minutes later was this compared um, to the first one? 11 minutes. Okay. So that's the second triplet. And then? And then the third one, Eddie, was at 131 AM. And that moves a little further. So now the ascendant's at 16 and a half Taurus. And most interestingly to me anyway, the midheaven's actually almost exactly, exactly conjunct Saturn here. Mm. Um, so Midheaven's 2653, assuming the seconds, you know, so um, Saturn's 2704. So it's like right on the Midheaven. And I thought that was so interesting and kind of telling in terms of the differences in their lives because he was the one who was supposedly, you know, I don't know if they overplayed like the authoritarian father piece. Like I almost, it was kind of similar to what you were talking about in terms of you don't know how much is the slant of who's telling the story versus you know them trying to find an explanation for mm -hmm. why his life went worse. Right. Um, his father seemed okay, but of course he was older at that point when he was interviewed for the movie. Yeah, it's like who knows? And I mean, so let's just take we'll take it for granted that 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 there's like a kernel of truth to that because it, it does yeah. actually like line up relatively well with the chart. Right, and that's what I was thinking is like you know even if he wasn't the worst father in the world. Um, the idea of someone more strict or authoritarian was Saturn right on the midheaven degree versus just sort of in the neighborhood, like with the other two charts. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite um, lines up really well. Yeah, and that ended up being really tough, also in terms of where the documentary went later. And again, like spoilers, mm. if you haven't seen it. Just like stop listening to us at this point. Watch it yeah. if you don't want to be spoiled, but. Um, one of the triplets and the, the one that was born the latest um, ended up uh, committing suicide like later in life. Mm. And um, he happened to be the one that had where Saturn was like right on the midheaven um, and that was born the latest and there right. and had supposedly, at least according to the documentary, again, caveat, uh, the more authoritarian father versus mm. the other two who had more supposedly. Um, supportive or, or loving or, or lenient fathers. Right. And I thought that was interesting in two different ways. I mean, one, maybe his father was actually more strict than the other two, and that was represented by Saturn conjunct the midheaven more closely. Um, alternatively, or and, and or, um, you know, sometimes when you have something like that, it's like things the, the person has a stronger tendency towards being more negatively impacted by things. Like they're more, you know, they have a stronger tendency towards depression or something like that. He right. ended up having manic depression, um, which preceded, you know, his suicide. And um, so it's like you, it doesn't always represent the externals, or at least it's not only the externals necessarily. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, maybe his father was more strict than the others, but also maybe he was more impacted by that than the others would have been. Yeah, and I think they were saying at different points in the documentary that he was the one who ended up committing suicide. Was the one that was more interested in delving into initially like finding their mother and they mm -hmm. were able to track her down or was the one that was most invested initially in the reunion of the three triplets mm -hmm. and some of the things surrounding that. But then um, after they started a business together and, and they ran into some problems and tensions and one of the triplets left, you know, it's possible that he was one of the ones that was more impacted by that or took it harder, Yeah, like that separation. Yeah, um, that's actually were... what they said, is that he took it really hard compared to the others. Okay. 
So yeah, there's a lot of different things, but it was also interesting because I think it was the first one, didn't we decide who was born first, hmm. um, who had the- The doctor father? I thought it was well. One of the ones who had one of like the supposedly, at least according to the documentary, the more supportive father figure had the IC closer to like the uh, son. Yeah, I think that's actually the middle one, though. Mm. Yeah, it would have made more sense if it was the first one, but I think it was actually the middle one. Okay, because I think that first one, Bob Shaffron, was the one with the physician father who was like supportive but also not able to be there as often. Right. Versus the one in the middle had the like blue collar father who was like very jovial and supportive. Right. So that actually brought up the other point, though, that was really interesting, which is the difference that you can't control or predict, but is the wild card factor in terms of astrology and how two people born with the same or similar birth charts, whether we're talking about twins or triplets, as in here, or whether we're talking about two people, especially that were born at the exact same time with the same birth chart, but to different families. Mm -hmm. One of the other factors astrologically. That has to be taken into account, or is actually relevant in a person's actual life, is you know who are their parents and what is the synastry between the child who has that birth chart and the parents, and is the synastry something that is a little bit more flowing and supportive, or is the synastry a little bit more challenging so that there's inherent, it's describing inherent tensions or incompatibilities between the parent and the child that are maybe felt more difficultly by one or both of them. Right, and you can't see that at all by the birth chart itself. Yeah, it's the one factor that the birth chart doesn't contain but is actually crucial when it comes to this, you know, the the nature versus nurture question because that's the nurture side of things. I guess the birth chart is the nature side of things, but then part of the nurture side is the synastry of the family unit, mm -hmm. unit which can involve the parents, it can also involve siblings. It can involve other factors as well in terms of like the home and living situation or the financial situation early on and different things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the film just brought up all sorts of things like that, but it definitely also was a good study. And we haven't done a very in depth one, but we just, there were little things that you do notice as astrologers when it comes to seeing three charts like that and seeing what happened with the angles in their lives mm. and seeing that kind of track a little bit what. They ended up saying in the documentary. Right, for sure. I thought it was also interesting that not only the third one, Eddie, had Saturn right on the midheaven, but his ascendant degree, speaking of those angles, actually was the one that got much closer to squaring that stationary Uranus in the fourth. Mm. Um, you know, not that that's everything in itself, but both of those together are kind of interesting. So it got to what, 16? 16 and a half, yeah. So it's about seven degrees off. The other ones are not nearly as close. Uranus is at 23, 23. so it's like six degrees. Yeah. Right? Um, it was about seven. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just thought that was interesting as well. Um, I think the biggest piece was like Saturn landing right on the midheaven and that being different for, compared to the other two. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing we didn't check, I didn't look at all, is like if any lots changed signs or anything like that. I tried to look at the lot of the father and <laughs> that one changed, but the first one was in Libra the, for Bob Shaffron and the other two were in Scorpio. Wait. Um, is spirit in Taurus for all of them? Uh, I think, I think so. Yeah, zero four. Yeah, depends on if the times like exact. Right. Yeah, because the first one is like just barely right. Yeah. Yeah. But there's stuff. Yeah, fortune's the same, and it's actually interesting if you do look at the zodiacal releasing from the lot of fortune. I mm. mean, it, it is angular from Malefix and with a little loosing of the bond to Capricorn, the sign of Saturn in the night chart. Um, when Eddie killed himself, and then which would also have been like a major life event in a bad way for the other two. And they yeah. all had the same, you know, releasing sequences. Yeah. Um, and then with twins, like there becomes a weird thing sometimes about whether um, using derived houses, there's anything there. Like in the Indian tradition, it's like the third house is younger siblings, but the 11th house is supposed to be older siblings, and mm -hmm. whether that technique works and is applicable and changes. The experience of the chart or where um, different siblings, if you're talking about twins or triplets, where they experience mm. um, specific siblings from in different parts of their life or different parts of their chart right? Um, that are all interesting questions. If somebody wanted to do a more systematic or like thorough um, study of, of twins and, and triplets and so on and so forth. For sure. 
Yeah, there's something that um, sometimes people also do like divisional and I have not played it around enough with 12th parts to like say anything definitively, but I did actually like look at all of them just to see. And it was quite interesting to me that Eddie's, which was the third one, um, actually had the harshest um, of the three, which is mm. kind of interesting. His ascendant, 12th parts of ascendant and midheaven landed right with um, the 12th part of Saturn. So again, more of a Saturn influence than the other two. Right. And I don't know if you can do 12th parts with outer planets because it's kind of mixing metaphors, but it actually landed uh, 12th parts of Uranus right on his natal ascendant exactly, which was fascinating. Okay. So, you know, he was the one, you know, from a few different directions that had something else going on compared to the other two. Yeah. I've never, I never used to pay that much attention to 12th parts. And until um, people always say that they think I have, I must have heavy Virgo placements. Right. And I've always said, my classic response is like, is no, it's just people are misinterpreting my Mercury Saturn conjunction, which is in the 10th house with. Saturn squaring my ascendant for mm -hmm. Virgo characteristics, which right. is understandable. But then somebody at one point, a few years back, pointed out that I actually have um, my 12th part for my ascendant. If you break up Aquarius into 12, two and a half degree segments, um, that my ascendant degree is in the 12th part of Virgo. So that would give me Aquarius rising, but with a Virgo sort of overlay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it could be. Yeah, no, it could be. Um, I always like that my 12th part of my ascendant is in the ninth for astrology. Okay. Um, but I otherwise haven't played around a lot with it, but I thought that was really interesting because I did bother to look at those three and his was more striking than the others. Yeah. Um, in a, striking in a sort of negative way. And when it, But when it comes to t twins and stuff, that is stuff that you would look into in order mm -hmm. to differentiate them as, as subdivisions and divisional charts and things like that. Right. Yeah. All right. So that's pretty good. I think that's good for that film, right? Yeah. That's that's most of what we were thinking about. Um, the only other thing that I had thought about was that there were um, there are other multiple births um, that were in the same study, and they showed briefly towards the end of the movie a pair of twins, um, two women, who found out in the course of this that they were also part of this study unknowingly. Oh, right. And I looked up their chart, and I don't have it pulled up ready but um well because they said it in the film and yeah we, 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 we both got excited because they <laughs> she reads a letter from the adoption agency that told her her exact day and time of birth right. like on in the documentary yeah and it has it like printed on the letter visually and we're like wait freeze that right. <laughs> let me pull that up um you know watching movies with astrologers <laughs> um it involves a lot of pa pausing <laughs> to like cast charts including even for some like hypothetical charts that we'll get to later. Right, right. Um, so I did pull that up. Um, it, it didn't jump out as much as these, you know, in terms of the luminaries in the third and stuff. But it was interesting that um, I did pull the one up of the woman who read the letter in the film, and Saturn was ruling her third, even though it was a day chart this time, and it was within about four degrees conjunct the IC. Okay. So again, you know, sort of a major Saturnian role in her life of something about siblings and something Saturnian about siblings, i.e., like removing a sibling or distance from a sibling. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. So that's that one. All right. Um, one of the other ones, the next movie, so one of my favorite movies is Stranger Than Fiction, which came out in 2006. And it's like a Will Ferrell movie, but it was, I think it's like one of the first or the first where he played more of a dramatic role instead of his usual. This was during like a string of comedies that he was doing in the in the 2000s. Um, so starring Will Ferrell and Maggie Gyllenhaal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so what was the synopsis? So the main plot follows Harold Crick, an IRS agent who begins hearing a disembodied voice narrating his life as it happens, seemingly the text of a novel in which it is stated that he, the main character, will soon die, and he frantically seeks to somehow prevent that ending. Right. So it's basically like he starts hearing the voice of a narrator as though it's a narrating a book, um, narrating every action that he takes um, during the course of his day. Yeah, which is like a really amazing premise. And again, it's like spoilers because we're going to ruin the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't seen it yet, and you don't want to hear the ending. Um, so he starts hearing a narrator, and it's basically just that that concept is really the main primary thing. There's a few things uh, in terms of why I like it as an astrologer, but um, that premise of like, what if you're just like going about your daily life and all of a sudden you hear somebody narrating your life and your inner thoughts, but also your actions and your choices mm -hmm. that are coming about as a result of your own free will, but for some reason like somebody 
some there's some omniscient what did they say at some point like third person omniscient third person omniscient yeah uh narrator who seems to be narrating it and in a, in a way that is you know people's experience sometimes of astrology if you're doing it as an astrologer on a regular basis is this very weird and sometimes eerie experience of um living your life and making choices as a result of your own volition which are sometimes then you you if you pay attention to astrology, the astrology itself is some sort of describing those choices as you're making them, um, even though it doesn't seem like it, it should be, and it's not really clear why that's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's parallels with some of the other ones we've talked about so far. You know, like the Slumdog Millionaire, it is written kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So basically, he's saying, you know, he realizes that someone besides him is mapping out the trajectory of his life. Yeah, you know, there is a there is an author to his life that is not him. Yeah, um, but then the problem is that at some point the narrator, who it's like a woman with a English, a British accent, and she says something like, "Little did he know that he is about to die," or something like that, mm -hmm. and then it freaks him out because all of a sudden the narrator, who's been right about everything up to that point in describing his mundane day-to-day -day life, is suddenly saying that he's he's going to die soon and his impending doom is like somehow coming up in the not too distant future. Right. So he runs out, tries to figure out what to do about this, goes see a psychiatrist. She's like, you need to take medication. He's like, no, I'm not schizophrenic. And and then that leads him to, he's like, well, what if, what if another alternative possibility here, who would, you know, what would you tell me to do? And he's like, maybe some, she was like, maybe someone with literature um, knowledge because it's a narrative, right? <laughs> right. And that's my favorite part. Actually, it was more than the most like creative and like brilliant parts of the movie is then he goes and he sees Dustin Hoffman, who plays like um, a literature professor. Mm -hmm. And then they go about trying to figure out what kind of story he's in. Right. Is and he what... is a tragedy, a comedy? <laughs> he right. starts making like check marks next to each one. <laughs> yeah, and they go through a process of um ruling out different things that he could be in in order to figure out what the correct one is. Right. And through that, they eventually um, do narrow down, and he figures out. He sees on TV at some point an old interview with the author, and he realizes that's her voice. And she's like a famous writer who, unfortunately, has written seven books, and she always kills the main character at the end of her her books. Right, right. The professor's like, "Oh, I'm sorry. That's the yeah. You're in one of those. <laughs> right. They always die." <laughs> um, one of the things I thought was really interesting um, in the course of their interactions that has a tie into astrology um, is um, he's like he's telling um, Will Ferrell to like stay home one day and do nothing because mm. he's trying to figure out whether the action will proceed forward without him trying to do anything or whether it's actually more the volition from his own actions. Um, which I think has interesting metaphysical things going on with it. Um, the professor says, some plots are moved forward by external events and crises. Others are moved forward by the characters themselves. If I go through that door, the plot continues, the story of me through the door. If I stay here, the plot can't move forward, the story ends. Um, so I thought that was interesting in that like, yeah, you actually astrologically, you can't ever stop things from happening, right? I mean, you can't stop action from going forward. Like something will happen regardless. I mean, sort of, it's both, because there's both, it's both categories. Sometimes there are things that require choices on your part, but sometimes there's things that are outside of your control that do force you to go in a certain direction. For sure. Yeah. I mean, and to really test it, you would have to just like do nothing for a while. Well, you can. I mean, sometimes I've done that of trying different things, like when you see a bad transit coming, because sometimes bad transits will come and happen and something goes wrong in your life that's a matter of you messing something up or, mm -hmm. or doing something wrong like having a mars transit and accidentally like cutting yourself mm -hmm. or burning yourself on a stove or something like that or driving and getting in a car accident because mm -hmm. you were you were being irresponsible or or not paying attention right. versus sometimes you can like as an astrologer see a bad transit coming and stop doing everything and then just, which was very similar to that one scene where mm -hmm. he's just stopped and he's not doing anything, but then something will still happen um, that is an external event that happens to you that's that's negative or challenging, um, yeah, that's outside of your control. Right. So in this case, in the movie, like he stays home all day and tries to do absolutely nothing, and like a big construction crane like comes and eats half of his apartment while he's home. Right. <laughs> and and then so he runs into the professor again and the professor's like 
you know, because this was supposed to be a test, you know, and um, the professor's like, meeting an insurance agent the day your policy runs out is coincidence. Getting a letter from the emperor saying he's visiting his plot. Having your apartment eating by a wreck eaten by a wrecking ball is something else entirely. Harold, you do not control your fate. So it's basically saying the action is continuing even if you try to stop it. Right. Yeah, the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting, uh, life, life as narrative or you know, plot devices and things like that was an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to the ancient notion of um, astrology being connected as a language and as like the heavenly script, mm -hmm. but in this context, being more like if your life was a book, and you know, how would it? What would the narrative be, and how would it be divided into different chapters and subsections, mm -hmm. and what parts of that narrative are as a result of you making choices and actions and decisions versus uh, what things are external circumstances that happen to you or that force you to go in certain directions. Right. And how those in some ways are artificial categories in themselves, but actually interact constantly. Yeah. Um, but then what was funny and what set up the, the comedy portion of what was otherwise a dramatic film is him suddenly, through some weird accident, becoming aware of his narrative as it was happening. And the one, the initial um, problem that creates with him, but then later when he discovers who the writer is that's actually writing his life and is in the process of finishing up the novel, which will contain the end of his life and how he dies, um, then there being a crisis on her part and realizing that she, in writing this like fiction book, is somehow um, narrating this person's actual living life and the sort of crisis that creates for both of them. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and one of the ones that this brought up for me that was different than some of the other films was issues with like the length of life mm -hmm. and notions about like how a person dies or what the end of, of a person's life is or when that is, or um, even issues about knowing that. Because one of the sort of beautiful and touching things about that is once she finishes the book, she gives it to him and he and the literature professor read it, and they're like, this is actually really good, and this mm -hmm. is the perfect ending to the book. And the literature professor makes the argument that you're inevitably going to die at some point mm -hmm. um, in some way, and there's no way that you're going to end up dying in a way that's more beautiful and, and fitting and poetic and admirable than this death that she's written for you in some way. Mm -hmm. And he, partially as a result of that, once he reads it, the main character ends up accepting that in some sense, and there ends right. up being almost like an acceptance of his fate in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, he kind of comes to peace with it. He starts to just live his life in his last days as though he would normally do. Yeah, he makes the most of it also. Mm -hmm. um, like He goes out of his way to live it to its fullest and do all the things that he would have done that he would only do if he realized that his time wasn't infinite, but it was you know, had a limit in the not too distant future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And because of that, you know, then there's a different ending. Right. Um, and so basically the author changes it at the last minute, be partially because he's at peace with it. And she has this great quote. Um, and the professor asks, why did you change it? And the author's like, because it's a book about a man who doesn't know he's about to die and then dies. But if the man does know he's going to die and dies anyway, dies willingly, knowing he could stop it, then, I mean, isn't that the type of man you want to keep alive? Mm. So there's definitely like theological overtones going on with this one and also with uh, the Adjustment Bureau. It's a similar thing right. where like you're sort of like by sort of being a good person or being, you know, doing what's perceived as like the good thing to do, you know, either accepting your fate or going or exercising your free will, you know? Well, because he dies like trying to save a young child. Right. Yeah. And so then the author's like, oh, well, he's such a good person. And then I'm I'm going to let him live. He'll just be very injured, <laughs> but I'll let him live. Right. Um, yeah. Well, that then also reminds me in and of itself, the, uh, you know, there is like a classic in ancient astrology, like length of life technique that was like invented around the first century BCE. And then a lot of astrologers dealt with. It was one of the classic um, techniques that all astrologers dealt with. And Ptolemy says that according to probably the ancient author who introduced the technique named Petasiris, that the purpose of doing this technique before any of the others when you're interpreting a birth chart is that uh, you don't want to, as the astrologer, predict great things for somebody who isn't going to live long enough to see them. Mm -hmm. 
So there was this like great actual preoccupation with determining the length of life in ancient Western astrology, and that sort of dropped out um, nowadays for various reasons. Um, it is still somewhat alive and well in some parts of the Indian tradition. But um, I've been meaning to do an episode. I'm going to do it at some point if I figure out how to do it like well and like carefully talking mm -hmm. about that as like a historical thing, as mm -hmm. well as some of the different ethical implications and other things of like that. Right. that I'll get to someday. But it made me think about yeah some of that and some of the issues surrounding that that do come up if something like that was possible with like the length of life technique. And one of the modern answers to that when I took like a module where we compared like the ancient a couple of years ago when we compared the western length of life technique to some of the indian techniques is how sometimes in those techniques people will hit um a bad point that will indicate like a cr a critical hit to a person's vitality mm -hmm. and how in the ancient world with like ancient medicine and everything else how some of those things could have been the end of a person's life, right. but that nowadays with modern medical technology and other things, um, a person might survive something that would have killed them, you know, two thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So that some of the techniques, one of the theories, for example, that some astrologers, you know, naturally put forward is that maybe the techniques are just showing various critical points in a person's health history mm -hmm. or in terms of a person's health and vitality right. that could be like exit points in that person's story in terms of their physical um, vitality and well-being mm -hmm. but don't necessarily have to be the actual like definite um, end point to their life yeah for sure which i honestly didn't find was a very satisfying like answer like 15 some odd years ago when i was at kepler and i said mm -hmm. no no if it's the length of life technique it should tell you <laughs> when you're going to die and either it does that or it doesn't do that because yeah. otherwise to me at the time it sounded like a like an excuse or like something yeah. yeah but i'm a little bit more um okay with that actually as a as a thing here yeah no i think that makes point. total sense yeah cuz you know the astrology isn't going to change and so if there's something else that changes i.e. modern medicine being able to save lives a little bit better, then sure, then it's going to be more hits to vitality. I think it makes total sense. I was thinking about that piece as well because he was actually fairly injured um, in the movie, but he was in a hospital and doctors were taking care of him. And so he didn't actually fully die. He just was very injured, but he would take a few months and then he'd be better. Right. Yeah. He like broke a bunch of bones and was in like a full body cast. Mm -hmm. So he was seriously critically injured, but survived. Right. And they said that he just survived through an act of chance through like his um, wristwatch, who was which was like tied into the story in some weird mm -hmm. way that wasn't fully articulated. Um, like got lodged in his arm and like stopped him from bleeding out or something through an act of chance or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean that's one of my favorites. Not one of your favorite movies. <laughs> Well, you see, completely aside from the metaphysical piece, it has a manic pixie dream girl uh, storyline okay. <laughs> wherein there's a love interest that would totally not have gotten together with him and they do not explain why she's interested in him at all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, you're not you're not a fan of the like mid two thousands manic pixie dream girl trope, and mm -hmm. you don't feel like Maggie Gyllenhaal would have gotten together with Will Ferrell. There was no reason. <laughs> all right, I don't. I disagree, and you're like ruining this for all like boring middle, middle aged guys. Um, that that fantasy. Mm -hmm. So you got you have suspension of disbelief. It was a I fantasy. Think. Okay, <laughs> yeah. a fantasy directly on one side of the aisle. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm sure. Did we figure out what the like? alternative was of that or did we figure out oh, if there was a whether well, there's, there's a male equivalent of manic pixie dream girl yeah i'm not sure if there is i was like mid google search and then okay. sort of forgot about it <laughs> yeah all right well people can let us know in the comments if yeah. there is a different version of that yeah please let us know our th your theories okay all right so that's stranger than fiction so at this point we're sort of transitioning away from Talking about some of like the really good movies or the movies that I really like to another subtopic, which is just like there's also been some not very good movies made that involve astrology that are on like varying levels of like good or bad. And I was trying to think of different 
just movies that are connected with astrology or mention it. And there's definitely a bunch, or there's ones that we didn't get to um, that either have astrological allegories or that are directly related to astrology um, in some way or incorporated into the narrative that I know that we've missed or completely overlooked. Um, I know some people mentioned like The Arrival, mm-hmm. which we watched a few years ago, but we didn't rewatch and has some themes having to do with like time and time travel and language and things like that that are interesting and kind of relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is there? There's lots of movies out there about time travel that we're just not covering here today. Yeah, that are sometimes interesting or useful in terms of astrology. Um, there's sometimes documentaries, like the History Channel did a documentary on astrology that they back in like the mid 1990s mm. that features some astrologers like Rob Hand it features like a dot matrix printer that's like painfully slowly printing up like a birth chart mm-hmm. in like 1994 1985 right to give the kids like some idea of like what it was like to print up on the early computers you know mm-hmm. a birth chart right if you do a search on Google for like History Channel astrology documentary, it comes up like pretty high because they posted it in the past year or two as a free, just like video on YouTube. Mm-hmm. This used to be like a History Channel thing, so that's worth checking out. Mm-hmm. I had an honor- honorable ma- mention for uh, Sliding Doors from 1998. Okay, that was uh, like a early Gwyneth Paltrow movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was basically just the two totally different life trajectories that would happen if this person either missed their train or made it on time. Right. And like everything that rippled out from there in two different directions. Yeah. Mm. I liked that one. You didn't like it so much, but- It was pretty depressing. <laughs> it was depressing at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of spoilers. But um, the one thing I did like about that one that was interesting in terms of relations to astrology was- Um, how even in the two different timelines that she had going on, she still had some constants that were happening in both lives. Mm. Um, Like she got pregnant in both lives and at the same time and things like that. She got into an accident towards the end in both lives. And I thought that would be actually how it works. If you think about if there are fate and free will elements of astrology, then like you would still have a lot of constants, even if there were some differences in different timelines, depending on your your actions or decisions. Mm, right. Right. Because there, you would still have the same transits going on, you know, going forward from that point and things like that. Yeah, that's true. That's one of the unfortunate things of how you can actually never really test astrology. Is that's what it would take would um, be like if you could experience the same tra- exact transit twice. Um, with different circumstances and whether it could be different or whether it could go one way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can never exactly repeat the same transit precisely. Yeah, exactly. Because um, you can sometimes try to isolate that transit, but all the other transits around it are actually different so that mm-hmm. you're in completely different circumstances. Yeah, it's not. It's one of those things about astrology not being particularly amenable to the scientific method in terms of like charting birth chart lives and and you know events and things like that. Mm-hmm. There are some things you could do, but that's a side note. Um, but in many ways, it's not because of that factor. Yeah, it's hard to get a control, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and also because no two moments in time, each two moments in time are always unique. And even if there's sometimes overlaps or similarities in certain things, there's going to be other things that are wildly different. Mm-hmm. And the moments before affect the moments after, and it cascades out from there. Yeah, or even like some of the other ones we're talking about, like the the twins that were triplets that were separated at birth, and they're put into different circumstances. Even though they have similar charts, um, they get put in like different families, so they have like different synastry with their different families that then affects them in different ways and Mm -hmm. and matches or doesn't match with their chart in different ways. Right. Yeah. So that's one movie. Other movies I know in passing that have some like minor astrological element. I was just thinking this morning the movie, the like classic horror movie, The Omen. About like the birth of like the Antichrist starts, I think, with I think think some monks like observing like a rare alignment of the planets or something mm-hmm. like that. Okay. So there's like these little themes that are built into some Western, you know, thought and like religion and philosophy, and that in and of itself goes back to like the notion of the the Magi showing up to the birth of Jesus mm-hmm. by following some sort of unspecified astrological alignment that like led them to his birth supposedly right yeah all right um so in terms of other movies um there was a movie called five star day that came out in 2010 and i had originally heard about this 
like a year or two or three before it actually came out because I had read like a press release about it and that it was in a movie that was explicitly had an astrological premise. Um, and the premise was basically that there was a guy who on his birthday um, read his horoscope in like the birth in a, in a newspaper and it said he was going to have a great five out of five star day mm -hmm. but then he had a terrible birthday and like a bunch of different things went wrong in his life and it was a terrible day and so for a school project he was going to interview three other people who he found that were born on the same day mm. and see what kind of day they had on that same birthday yeah and he was basically going from the premise that astrology has no legitimacy that it was bullshit <laughs> in his words um propaganda and so forth he was doing this for an ethics class, interestingly. So mm. they didn't really develop that too much further, but I thought that was interesting in itself um, in terms of the ethics of fate and free will and things. Um, mm. So he goes and he finds the three other people and he finds out that they actually did all have terrible birthdays. Right. right. <clears throat> yeah. Like that ends up being the narrative for like 90, 90, 95% of the story. Right. And then something that we, um, we're always kind of baffled by at the end is like the ending is really weird because suddenly, even though the entire narrative is a, it seems like he's demonstrated um, the opposite of what he expected that hmm. the three other people who had his same birth chart and that's actually one of the things that's interesting is it's it describes and talks about birth charts and using mm -hmm. the birth time and birth chart placements and, and transits and all sorts of other things at the beginning. So there's a little right. bit more advanced discussion of astrology than you might normally see in a movie. Yeah. Um, and then it seems to, in its fictional narrative, um, set it up in a way that it's actually he accidentally, much to his surprise, validated astrology. Mm -hmm. But then in like at the very end, there's just like this monologue where he's like presenting the results of his findings and it unexpectedly veers in like an anti-astrology direction right. seemingly at least that was like my original I back in, in 2010 I remember both of us being very disappointed by it mm. um because it was surprised that it goes in that direction even though it doesn't seem like it's going to and then today when we rewatched it I almost wondered it still did that but I wonder if how that comes off to the audience was necessarily exactly what they were shooting for as the filmmakers, or if there's mm. some of that that just came out that way in editing, or or what? Because it's mm -hmm. kind of it kind of comes out of nowhere, right? Yeah, and it is interesting as you mentioned. There's more advanced pieces of astrology earlier. He goes out of his way. The character goes out of his way to not just find people born on the same day, which you would normally think from kind of like a general astrological film from people who are not astrologers, but actually like right around the same birth time and location, which is actually kind of advanced to know that that matters. Right. Um, you know, and they're all within like five minutes of each other or something um, in the same hospital. But um, yeah, the ending, I mean, it also, we were both talking about how, you know, this was supposed to be for like an undergrad philosophy class, basically, and it kind of, the ending monologue kind of sounded like that, <laughs> like mm. like how an undergrad philosophy person might think something sounded a little more profound than it did. Um, but it was basically like, well, it's what you do with what's handed to you, or it's what you do with bad experiences from there for from that point forward. Right. Was... That ended up being what he said at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's it's like, like it's up to. He was like, it's up to you. You are the choices that you make as a result of the cards you're dealt. Basically, is what it right. said. Yeah. But it didn't seem to dwell on the point very much that the actual experience of 90% of the narrative of the film up to that point seemingly was validating right. <laughs> um, that for whatever reason, um, all three of these independent people that had independent lives had experienced something subjectively negative on the same day. And like notably negative, not just like sort of negative, right? They all right. had like terrible days. Yeah, like like life-changing mm -hmm. events. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's one of those films that was just weird because it ends, it's not like, you know, it's a it's a low budget like indie film sort of to begin with, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just the the way it ended was always just kind of weird. Mm -hmm. But that's actually available on Netflix. We just discovered so you can stream it and watch it if you want to. Mm -hmm. And um, Netflix, I think that was on Amazon actually, um, mm. one of those. But um, it was funny too. It reminded me a little bit of like skeptics who like could get a little bit of evidence that astrology might work and then just completely dismiss it out of hand. Despite that, right. like remember there was there was some sort of um, study like that where they tried to like cover it up that it seemed to be validating something astrological. 
So it reminded me of that a little bit because it's like most of the entire film was like, oh, this seems to be working, actually. <laughs> and then they're like, well, we'll just put that aside in the last 10 minutes. Right. Yeah, that was what happened with the, the Gokulin result at first, where the skeptic committee accidentally like replicated the study, but they didn't think that was possible. So they thought they must have made a mistake. So they hid the results until they could figure out what had gone wrong to mm -hmm. validate astrology. Right. Um, yeah, I still don't how, understand what happened or with the ending of this film or, or what. And I wonder if something happened in editing or mm. it's one of the themes that sometimes comes up that's weird. I was curious who the editor was and if the editor was different than the writer and director who mm. it was his film. Because sometimes I've noticed, um, especially, especially people early in their film, filmography or do more independent stuff, like one of the other movies that we're going to talk about at the end, who, um, edit their film in mm -hmm. addition to writing and directing it, that that's not always a good idea because sometimes you want to leave in too much rather than cut out things that are unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But the f I guess the flip side of that is sometimes as the writer or director, you have a vision for what the film's supposed to be and what it's supposed to say. And so maybe you at least subjectively think that you do know what needs to be left in and what's crucial to the film better than maybe an external person does. For sure. Yeah. Pros yeah. and cons. Yeah. I thought the ending also was a little bit similar, even though I thought that the Adjustment Bureau was a way better movie in terms of execution. Um, they had similar endings in terms of just like kind of talking about fate throughout the movie and then the end, like free will triumphs, <laughs> like out of nowhere. Mm. Um, they're, you know, the differences, of course, but um, that ending on like free will is the good thing. Yeah. I mean, that's just part of our society yeah. and Western thought at this point is just that free will is always pitted as a light and dark, good versus evil mm -hmm. battle where free will is seen as good and, and um, fate is seen as, as bad. And, and honestly, right. that's actually for a large part, it's part of our like Christian heritage and Western society because mm -hmm. that became the battleground when Christianity um, became the dominant religion in Europe by the fourth century. Um, that became the dominant like objection to astrology was that it was impinging on free will and free will was very important to Christian ideology. Mm. Um, and so that became one of the primary reasons that astrology was suppressed after that point because of its close associations with fate mm -hmm. and was often skewed or looked at in a negative fashion versus up to that point fate wasn't necessarily seen as negative, but sometimes was seen as positive mm -hmm. in that other side of it, which is the the destiny side of it of right. you know, sometimes you're destined or you're fated to have good things happen just as much as bad things. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And we don't see a lot. It's pretty skewed in these movies. Um it was Slumdog Millionaire that I think is the only one that had more of a positive destiny thing going on. Right. Yeah, which ironically, even though it was a British film, was mm -hmm. one that was more um you know, inspired by a novel and loosely based on a novel that was written by somebody from India. Right. And um, yeah, astrology never really got quite as suppressed there comparatively. Right. Yeah. And notions sometimes of fate and free will are a little bit more, fate is not always seen as negatively or as oppressively. Right. Exactly. Especially being tied in with other concepts like karma and reincarnation and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else about that one? Um, you said it's available on Amazon. I think it's on Amazon and not Netflix, if I'm remembering right. Okay. Yeah, I think we watched it on Amazon. Um, I would say, in a non astrological sense, both um, a bunch of these end on uh, just love stories, sort of wiping out the entire philosophy of what's going on, <laughs> which actually I find a little annoying. Right? Okay. You're not <laughs> not much for I'm sentiment, not, romantic I sentiment. I'm, I guess I'm a non romantic <laughs> in these cinema things, but. Um, I mean, I'm not always non-romantic, but <laughs> but like some of these are just so you know blatant. Like they push the love story sort of to the foreground mm. and like ignore everything else we've been talking about up to that point. Right. So yeah. All right. Well, I think <laughs> I'm I, like yeah, yeah. They get I think, together. <laughs> I think I am much more um, like won over by some of that stuff than you are. <laughs> yeah, could be. All right. So that's a good transition into one of our other ones, which is again not objectively one of the best like films but this is one that we found way back like 12 years ago it's um an indian film titled what's your rashi that came out in 2009 and this is 
Um, Rashi is the one of the Indian terms for a sign of the zodiac. So the title of the movie is literally, "What's your sign?" And do you have like a synopsis? Um, let's see. This or is a rom- just describe it? romantic comedy film. Um, it says it's based on a, a novel and follows the story of Yogesh Patel, who must marry in ten days to save his brother from harm, financial harm. Um, Yogesh agrees to meet 12 potential brides, all played by the same actress, one from each zodiac sign, um, in order to get married within 10 days. Right. He's also going to inherit a whole bunch of money on it, um, upon his wedding, which is part of how he's going to save his brother because his brother owes like a ton of money to like the mob or something. Yeah, to some like gangsters. Mm-hmm. Um, so he has to get married. He has 10 days to do it. Um, there's different scenes like very early on where his father and mother are like visiting an astrologer and they're getting the brother's chart read and then they read the main character's chart and finds out that um, the astrologer predicts that when he gets married that he'll inherit a lot of money and then later that turns out to be true. And initially, like the astrology element is interesting because the astrologer is making like correct predictions and mm-hmm. seems to have, um, actual like knowledge of the future, and it's interesting seeing that coming from like an Indian film. And I don't, I don't know if this qualifies as like a Bollywood film, but it's mm-hmm. from sort of like Indian cinema and some of the different um, cultural connotations of astrology, and it's somewhat more accepted mm-hmm. acceptance in Indian culture. Right. Um, although, what's a little bit weird is like the astrologer, after initially, you know, being a smart, prescient. Um, character later turns in kind of weird because then mm. they somehow he has a side job as like a private investigator and he has like a weird comedic role later on that seems kind of odd. Right. Yeah. He's like tracking down whether like the brother the brother of the father is like cheating on his wife or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, Whole side plot. <laughs> it's like weird side. It's a really long movie. It's three and a quarter hours. It's three and a half hours. Okay. So it's almost three and a half hours and it's criticized for that in virtually all reviews. Mm-hmm. Although I didn't realize until this watch through why that was. And it's for a very classic reason that any professional astrologer that's ever written a sun sign column or rising sign column is very familiar with, which is anytime you try to do 12 of anything, like that's a lot of literally anything to do. Right. Right. And so they had to go through like the dates with each of the 12 women, each of the 12 signs, and therefore it's a long movie. Yeah. So it's a super long movie because there's 12 characters and the 12 women that the main character like dates are all played by the same actress. Mm -hmm. And at least according to Wikipedia, this set like a record for like the most characters played by a single actor or actress in a in a single movie. Mm -hmm. And she plays um 12 different characters. And in the Subtitles, it kept saying like sun sign, but right. I think it was just saying like in Hindi, it was saying like Rashi. Mm-hmm. So it might have been more like rising sign or like who knows if yeah. it was really even specified. It's just like different signs. Right. And it had an amazing one like opening where it has this James Bond style opening <laughs> representing each of the 12 zodiac signs. And then, um, Every zodiac sign has like a song and dance sequence, yes. and there's some like amazing, great like music and um, like singing intervals. If if you, if people are into musicals, mm-hmm. an astrology themed musical, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is very much that. Um, yeah, which is kind of funny because you know we're usually not in the frame of reference of Bollywood here, and so you know we don't usually get songs and dances for our characters. <laughs> I mean, the songs are actually stuck in my head now. I forgot that that's something that happens like. After you watch this movie, mm-hmm. the songs get stuck in your head. For sure, yeah. So it was interesting with the different signs. It seemed like for many of them, they had some sort of characteristics that were supposed to be appropriate for that sign. Sort of like well-known characteristics of those signs. Yeah, if you and if you do a search, like a Google search for like what's your Rashi blog review or Chris Brennan, you'll find like an, a very overly detailed <laughs> analysis of this movie in an old blog post that I wrote on my old blog, the Horoscopic Astrology blog from like 2009, yeah. 2010, where mm-hmm. I have like an analysis of like everything <laughs> they did right or wrong uh-huh. and like what they were going for with all the signs. And it seemed like they did go for specific characteristics with just about all the signs. There were just two mm-hmm. that didn't make as much sense or that we weren't sure what they were going for, which were Aries mm-hmm. and what was the other one? Libra. 
Uh, no, Aries I mean, Libra and to some degree Capricorn. I mean, they had a specific thing they're going for with Libra. I'm just not fully were, sure why. Yeah, I mean, Libra was almost more like Capricorn characteristics. And mm. I almost felt like they were going, I don't think they were because they probably weren't thinking this hard about it, but it reminded me of like this, like Saturn's exaltation in Libra because it was very Saturnian type of like contractual thing going on. Yeah, we're not really sure. That was one of the things where we weren't really sure in the movie, like how much they consulted with astrologers and how much they attempted to use astrology in any significant way to inform like the plot mm -hmm. and some of the characters, or to what extent it was just like a writer using that as a plot device with very little actual information and knowledge of astrology. Right. I mean, um, and some of the signs of the zodiac, they did take relatively typical traits. Yeah, or at least superficial knowledge of those signs. Yeah, like Gemini was like chatty mm -hmm. and, and kind of flighty, and Scorpio was like had a secret persona going on that was like right. sexy. Right, supposed to be a sexy character, yeah. and um, Pisces, I think, was kind of like new agey or something, mm -hmm. or, or like spiritual. Right. Sagittarius was was an was actually an astrologer herself, which I appreciated. <laughs> right, and she read his chart and like predicted some things. But then there was like a weird <laughs> curveball where she tried to like sleep with him. Yeah, in order she's to, like, like your first marriage from your chart that I see is going to not work out unless you have a full physical relationship with someone before you're married. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I myself knowing a Sagittarius uh, who might do something like that. <laughs> Yeah. No, it was funny though that they brought in that. Um, I appreciated the Sagittarius part that she was an astrologer. No, maybe the rest of it, but right. um, but but um, but it was interesting that they brought in that astrological knowledge beyond the superficial sign characteristics. You know, in the like that is something that is sometimes said in Indian charts. Like, oh, this will indicate that your first marriage will be bad or will fail, but then your second marriage will be okay. That kind of thing. Yeah, and or she that was bringing have, that in. That you have to do this propitiation ritual in order to avoid mm -hmm. this negative thing in order to get the second thing. Right, which I think she was going for in a sort of ad hoc fashion. Like She's like, well, if you sleep with me, then you will have had a relationship before you get married. <laughs> yeah, because there, well, there's a thing like that that has become like a, in the same way in the West that there's certain astrological concepts that have become more mainstream, like Mercury retrograde or like Saturn return. There is mm -hmm. one in India that is like, um, the Mars hmm. Kuja dosha, Kuja dosha, which is like hmm. a Mars affliction, which is right. when you have Mars in like the seventh or whole bunch of other ones, twelfth or like a couple other houses, is said to indicate bad marriage prospects, at least for the first marriage. Mm -hmm. And so, there's sometimes certain propitiation type things that are recommended to ward off of that. Like I, I don't know how often that's actually done or how serious that is, but I've heard one of like marrying a tree or something like that in order mm -hmm. to get. The first bad marriage out of the way, so that you can get to the second one. Right. And I don't know to what extent they were incorporating some like loose background knowledge of that. Mm. I know you you read we read my old blog post, and this was the one that was on Netflix, so people can actually stream What's Your Rashi on Netflix mm -hmm. in all its glory and its <laughs> musical um, interludes, uh -huh. of which there's basically like ten or twelve right. with each of the signs. Mm -hmm. um, but there used to be in the original because we got the DVD. Like we got <laughs> we were this. Very serious. <laughs> yeah, we we're very serious about this movie, and it has actually really great packaging and stuff, and great marketing. They had really good marketing originally, even though the movie didn't do super well in India. I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, and when we read the reviews, um, but yeah, what was I going to say? Just. I'm I'm not sure, but I mean, I think part of why we were serious about it is because it's just so novel that there's a movie that incorporates anything real about astrology. Well, that was the thing is they did have that was really interesting in the DVD. They had a, now I remember it was a, a warning saying like this. Oh yeah, movie, a disclaimer. It was like a disclaimer at the beginning mm. of the DVD, and we didn't see that in the Netflix version. So we don't know if they removed that or if we didn't just didn't see it at the beginning, saying mm. something about. This is not meant to be an accurate depiction of astrology because it seemed like they must have been nervous about offending mm. like people that believed in astrology in India or something right. like that, and some of the ways that they were taking creative liberties with certain things. Right. As well, and especially kind of making the character of the astrologer into sort of like not not completely great character. Yeah, in some ways as the like butt of a joke or something, mm -hmm. which was kind of weird at certain points. Um yeah, so it's not like a super deep or important film, but it's a really light <laughs> romantic comedy of sorts. Right. 
an Indian movie that incorporates some astrological themes. Mm -hmm. It was originally like on our list of just like bad astrology bad films, but now that I've rewatched it again, I actually like it m a little bit more than I remember liking it at the time. Yeah, same. I mean, it's not bad outright. It's just more like fluff, you know. Yeah, it's kind of like a light movie. Right. I do like like the, some of the songs and some of the graphics they did for like the James Bond um, intro featuring different signs mm -hmm. and like the actress that's playing the different signs. Right. Yeah. Areas was really off. I do remember that. There's some things that I don't know if they just didn't the filmmakers like didn't know or or it, you know again there may have been some things that happened in editing. Mm -hmm. Again, when they were cutting down like a three and a half hour film, but I also wondered mm. if there weren't any that were different things like East and West in terms of yeah. East and West conceptualizations of the For zodiac sure. signs, and if there were any ones that would have been more obvious to like an Indian astrologer versus mm. a Western astrologer, except so many of the ten seem to be very textbooks similar to what a Western astrologer, what Western like cliches are about certain signs as well. Exactly. And you know, they're not. There's a lot of overlap, even if there are some differences as well in how the signs are conceptualized sidereally and tropically. Right. So I mean, it is true that Aries tropically would potentially be Pisces sidereally, but I really don't know if it was that deep. I think they just didn't do a good job with Aries. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was it? It was just like she was trying to pretend to be something that she wasn't, I think was the yeah, main thing. Yeah, and she was kind of like meek and kind of like nerdy. Right. She wasn't very Marsy at all. Yeah. It was a little weird. And then yeah. the one that was more aggressive was like they made Libra be like a businesswoman yeah. that was like very assertive and like high powered and was like getting him to like sign a contract and mm -hmm. was treating the marriage like a contract early on. And then they did a musical interlude about him <laughs> controlling and like dominating him if they were in a relationship, which is interesting. And right. I wondered, it's like I didn't know if they're taking certain things theoretically from the signs or if they're also trying to take certain things if it was thought to be like the rising sign and what. Mm -hmm other indications I would have or something like that. I don't really know. Yeah. I don't think it went that far. Okay. That'd be my guess. I don't know, of course. And then Capricorn is more like beleaguered rather than by like family tradition rather than you would think that the Libra depiction would be more stereotypically like the Capricorn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's weird, but people should check it out and let us know if they notice anything interesting about each of the signs or what some of the motivations were for some of those that we overlooked or, or that might be unique to Indian astrology in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so that is What's Your Rashi, which like we said is on Netflix and possibly like other places so people can check that out. Um, what was our last, our very last one? Our very last one is Return of the Magi. Okay. So Return of the Magi was like a docudrama that came out in 2008 by an astrologer named Kelly Lee Phipps that we knew who sadly passed away um, several years ago. And um, it was made in the it was made in 2000 or it came out eventually in 2008. He was actually filming it over the course of a few years because I remember I knew Kelly and remember running into him and he was like interviewing tons of astrologers for this documentary over the course of a few years and he would go to conferences and just do tons of interviews like back to back to back. Um, but it was like his first film. He'd never done a film before, and he um, raised some money for it, and he was donated some money for it. I know he had one client who gave wrote him a check for this for something crazy, like like twenty thousand dollars or something like that, to buy a bunch of the equipment and the camera and other things that he needed to like make this vision project that he had mm -hmm. about doing not just a documentary about astrology where he. Um, he interviewed a bunch of astrologers of the time, but also they had this like dramatic component to it, which ended up being a little bit more of the part that didn't go as well. Um, where it, it was kind of it was imitating the style of a movie that was super popular in the mid two thousands, which is what the bleep do we know, mm -hmm. which is like a, a movie about metaphysical stuff where it like interviewed different scientists or metaphysical people that were expressing views about metaphysics or spirituality or philosophy or things of a more almost like new age bend but then it was interspersed with this dramatic component that was telling a narrative about like a central character that like drove the plot and added like some transition points into the different topics of the docu 
documentary drama. Mm -hmm. So Kelly tried to sort of imitate that and do a version of that for astrology because basically Mm -hmm. for years, astrologers have always said, like, why isn't there a good movie or a documentary about astrology that talks about and really shows what the astrological community is about in a way that's positive and and a more accurate reflection of what astrologers actually do and think and believe. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, there hasn't been, and and honestly, there still isn't. And it seems like that project itself often runs into weird problems and like roadblocks um, that at different points have made me despair about whether that's ever going to happen or if anyone's ever going to get it together to do a project like that successfully in a way that it would need to be done. Mm -hmm. So. Kelly kind of took it upon himself to do that, um, but it was like his first film, and he was very much when you're watching it, it, he was learning as he went, and you mm-hmm. can kind of see the process of that learning. And eventually, what happened is he approached when I was the president of the Association for Young Astrologers, approached us and our board to help him um, premiere the film at the United Astrology Conference in 2008, which was in May of 2008 in Denver, mm-hmm. and. We got together with him and did that, and we hosted a big premiere, you know, in front of in this huge auditorium in downtown Denver, in front of like two thousand astrologers. Um, but then it just did not go super well because that was the first time I think he finished it like very shortly before it was done, and it was his first film. And in addition to writing and directing it, he also edited it himself, mm. which is extremely hard and and. Older I've gotten, and the more I've gotten into doing video for the podcast and things like this, the more I understand what Kelly sort of went through to some extent in filming it as mm-hmm. a first time filmmaker, which is it's always really incredibly hard to write and direct something and then also to edit it because it's really hard for a creator to like remove and get rid of stuff mm-hmm. and to have the sort of objective objectivity that you need in order to know what you need to cut. Versus what is okay to keep. Mm-hmm. So, the runtime of the final movie is just like wildly long. It's like three hours long almost. Almost, yeah. Like 240? Two, something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the people weren't professional actors who did the dramatic roles. Yeah. So, so the, the biggest issue that ended up being the biggest issue with it was um, he didn't have like actors. He just had like friends and family members basically act out the dramatic parts. Mm. And he had this dramatic narrative or storyline that ran throughout it about like a girl who runs into hard times and then she befriends an astrologer and learns about astrology and then her life becomes better. And she has an astrology reading at one point Mm -hmm. that's really long. And then that's like the end of the movie Uh and she finds happiness or something. Right. It's basically about like trying to show the value of astrology. Right. And for people who have been unaware of it. And then Lots and lots of interviews with professional astrologers. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the cooler part, honestly. <clears throat> and it's even interesting now to look back because, of course, that really um, froze in time some of like who the astrologers were that were known. And some of them are still, um, but some of them have passed away since then, you know, um, 13 years ago. Right. Um, like, so, like Robert Blaschke's. Mm hmm. In the film, and he passed away more than ten years ago. Chris McRae Chris who passed Mc- away more recently. He passed away just in the past year. Tim Terriker. Yeah, the head of Mount Astrologer Magazine. Mm-hmm. Paul Reeder, who was an astrologer, a lot of us knew from MySpace, who passed away, I think, like a decade ago. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's re- and it's really good, and is still good for that. And a lot of the interviews that Kelly did were really amazing. And he had like a YouTube channel at the time where he was releasing longer cuts of many of the interviews. That would eventually end up in small segments in the film. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the other things that he was struggling with in terms of the running time was just he had interviewed so many astrologers. You can see how he was trying to find places for bits of all of those interviews, but there were just so many of them. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what the final count was. It had to have been something like 30 or 40 plus astrologers mm-hmm. that he was trying to fit in different parts of the film. And he did break it up very loosely or broadly into different categories of some topics. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, it just needed to be cut down a little more. And I know that it would have been really hard to do those interviews and then to cut any of them. Mm. Um, but yeah, it needed to be streamlined a little bit more. Yeah. So the the <laughs> premiere didn't go very well. Um, it mm-hmm. ended up being really long. We, we premiered it somewhat late at night. So the mm-hmm. fact that it was like three hours long and it was in the middle of this 
what was already like a major, like the biggest astrology conference of the decade in 2008, um, like a lot of people had walked out by yeah. the end, basically, and mm -hmm. it wasn't like universally received super well. Right. Um, yeah, I had always meant to recut it, and at some point, I I will or still may at some point, or I'd like to like recut it to just you basically need to get rid of the dramatic portion of mm -hmm. it. Um, because that didn't end up working out despite everyone's best efforts, and just focus on, to whatever extent you can, the interview segments of it, and there would mm. be something really valuable there. Yeah, there's still going to be some like technical issues in terms of hit. You, I can tell more how he was learning as he went, and so in some of the earlier interviews, some of his audio is a bit rougher mm -hmm. at different points, um, and his settings get better as he progressed as well because he was like learning and improving as he went and you can mm -hmm. see that if you know like I know what conferences he was at because I kept running into him at these conferences and we kept missing each other because he wanted to interview me mm -hmm. and then we finally did at one of the latest conferences at like a Northwest Astrology conference I think in Seattle it must have been in 2007 mm -hmm. he finally caught me for an interview like right before I went to do a lecture and mm -hmm. portions of that ended up in the movie Right. Um, so if anyone wants to see a very, very young Chris Brennan, <laughs> yeah. check this out. Like at 22 is what we figured out. Something must have like been. that, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of the interviews like don't have super good audio, or there's some people like standing outside and the like winds blowing really hard, or there was this one setting where there was a NCGR conference that was at like an old Masonic lodge that had been converted into a hotel, and there was this beautiful room that had a lot of interesting stone working in this like big um, sort of conference room or something like mm -hmm. that and a lot of interesting stone designs in the background and he filmed a bunch of interviews there because it had a great background setting for the interview subject but it was like a really echoey room so mm -hmm. the audio is really echoey in in that interview right yeah. yeah so just like technical things like that that will still be there but for what it is and I don't think it's actually widely available at this point it might be actually really mm -hmm. hard to find but hopefully at some point it'll be recut to just do a better sort of second version of it to present some and preserve some of those interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like a snapshot in time of like astrologers at that point. Lots of astrologers are who are still practicing. Um, yeah, it had very good aims, I think. You know, and you could tell, especially in the beginning of the movie, it was about trying to make astrology respectable and that, that it had like fallen into disrepute over time, but that like really good people do astrology and that kind of thing. And it can be like really helpful to your life. I think that was the aim in portraying that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just had really good aims and um, yeah, for what it was worth, it was still captured a lot of, you know, astrologers that were professional speakers and on the lecture circuit at that point in time or that were doing mm -hmm. interesting work and what their thoughts were about astrology and how they wanted to present it to the, the world, which is a really admirable project and mm -hmm. in some ways influenced what I've tried to do with the podcast over the past decade to some extent because I always also wanted to do something like that. And then um, in some ways, what I ended up doing with the podcast and wanting to interview different astrologers was in wanting to do like a version of that in a way that was more w what I would want to see. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. And mostly based on the nonfiction part rather than the fiction part. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that movie, but also that's just that's the context where there still hasn't been a movie like that. And I still mm -hmm. hope at some point that somebody does, you know, that has some like filmmaking experience. Like I don't have that. And the more I've gotten into this, I've understood the value and wished that I had like gone to film school or something like that. So I wasn't mm -hmm. learning things in the same way that Kelly did, sort of on your own just by doing them, which is, you know, often as astrologers, how you have to do things. Like most astrologers mm -hmm. are self-taught and we sort of learn by doing and by self um education. Mm -hmm. Um but I've learned the value of some of those things of how you know film and filmography and cinema cinematography is its entire field that people dedicate their entire lives to. Yeah. Um, so I hope somebody at some point with that kind of background does put together like an actual astrology documentary and does a good job that can display what astrology is that's more palpable to the public. Yeah, and it seems like someone you know sort of more on the inside of the astrological community needs to be 
involved in something like that because invariably, you know, whenever they do these little move, you know, film clips, um, not movie, but I mean, what am I trying to think of? Like little doc clips, like news clips. Like anytime, yeah. like a news organization or somebody does something on astrology, they try to sensationalize it, mm -hmm. and they usually try to mock it or right. present it as this weird, stupid thing. Yeah, know? like there was a Vox thing at U at the last UAC, UAC twenty eighteen. Well, and with stuff like like Vox or other things like that, it's always much more overtly like antagonistic or or attacking. Well, it's like even when they do a good job or sort of a good job and try to get like some accurate stuff in there, like they've asked one of them asked us for like feedback on like accuracy, but like they always have to add in like, oh, but it's probably fake, you know, like something that sort of casts like suspicion or derision or like laughing at astrology for balance or something, mm -hmm. you know, and so. That's why it would be nice if someone more internal to the astrological community that also had some film tie-in could do something like that because um, otherwise it's it's always kind of portrayed badly. Yeah, just even if it doesn't, even if it's not a fluff piece for astrology, it always just inevitably, especially by outsiders, gets portrayed in some sort of um, weirdly distorted light, mm -hmm. and that was ultimately what was refreshing and sort of groundbreaking in in whatever respect. About Kelly's attempt was the attempt to sort of for astrologers to take it into our own hands to actually document what the internal thoughts and discussions are of a variety of different astrologers in the community mm -hmm. and to provide that sort of snapshot of what astrologers are saying at that point in time. Right. And really to try to portray that directly rather than with some sort of outside lens. Right. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully at some point. Um, somebody pulls that off. I mean, there's been other various um, attempts, but none have been terribly successful at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there was one one documentary that there was a Kickstarter for several years ago that was supposed to be partially based on the work of Richard Tarnas, but that's been weirdly another one of these what seems like um, not, projects that has not gone very well or. It's been delayed numerous times, mm. and it seemed like it was originally set up in a way that already seemed a little bit questionable, and that it was going to focus on the Uranus-Pluto square, which a lot of the mundane astrologers, but especially the the Tarnas um, school, were very focused on in the early 2010s when like Uranus was squaring Pluto, and there was some stuff going on in places like the Middle East at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but by focusing on that. It was a little bit problematic to start with because then the movie kept having major delays. So now mm -hmm. it's talking about a mundane astrological alignment that's like way in the past and largely no longer relevant at this point. And it was kickstarted as like a single movie, and I mm -hmm. actually put money in for it because that's I wanted to see something like that. But mm -hmm. now it's been turned into like a twelve-part series, and it keeps getting delayed. And I'm very not. Um, Optimistic about it at this point, but we'll we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm, for sure, yeah. I mean, you talking about obstacles in people trying to make these kind of things reminds me of the like, is astrology supposed to be a cult kind of discussion? Is like, is there a reason that it shouldn't be front and center in everyone's mind, but only people who should find it find it? You know? Yeah, I mean, it does feel like a sort of curse at this point that astrology never. None of these projects to give any sort of decent treatment of astrology ever really sort of come out super well, and that's one of the things we've touched on in some of these um, films and just things that have gone awry or just not come out that well, or why we focused more on in some instances for like half of this, just like fictional movies mm -hmm. that are sort of like broadly might be seen as astrological allegories instead mm -hmm. of actual movies about astrology because right. there's really not right. Um, many or any that have gone terribly well. Mm -hmm. But, and yeah, that question about whether that's always going to be the case or whether there will be something that will break through that at some point, um, or whether, you know, I know Demetra always talks about where you're talking about this idea of astrology as a as an archetype or as like an entity that ultimately in some part of it wants to remain obscure and mm -hmm. that's part of its very nature. And right. so while it might Come up and like surface every once in a while, and sometimes you get these larger public periods of interest in astrology, which we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. That that's always somewhat temporary, and then there's always this eventual like submerged submersion of it again, where it sort of like goes away or becomes 
banned or societally things start going against it or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I certainly don't want society to be against astrology per se, but I'm otherwise more or less okay with it being like quasi occult because I don't know. I, I sort of do feel like in accordance with like the people that should find it do find it rather than like everyone should be all about it. Because yeah. sometimes people treat it badly who don't really have the right motives or something. Yeah, or if it was widely accepted, would it get like perverted in different ways mm -hmm. or become institutionalized in ways that are weird or mm -hmm. inappropriate or um, you know, not not helpful ultimately, which ideally we would like astrology to be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see what happens if there's any astrology documentaries someday that do a better job. In the meantime, I'm going to keep shooting interviews with astrologers and sort of documenting it in that sense, mm -hmm. and occasionally doing fun little episodes like this talking about uh, the social or artistic or literary or other ways that astrology sometimes shows up in society in different ways. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, All thanks right. for joining me for this today. Okay, welcome. Um, let us know. I guess people can let us know if there's any movies that we missed that were either right. like fictional movies that would be good for astrologers to check out that they might enjoy that have like astrological allegories or, or or narratives that might be interesting for various reasons to astrologers or even if there are other videos actually I did just remember there was one there was a documentary that was made that came, we found it a few years ago when the filmmakers posted on uh, Vimeo but it was a documentary from the U first United Astrology Conference oh, from 1986. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you Google like United Astrology Conference documentary 1986, you'll still find those videos on uh, Vimeo. Mm -hmm. And that was actually an interesting, again, additional astrology documentary that was not like widely released as far as I know. It was just published mm -hmm. online eventually, like many years later. Yeah. But it has a bunch of like interesting interviews with a bunch of striking, strikingly young looking astrologers, especially ones born in the 1940s who right. were only in their like 30s or 40s at that point. Yeah, that was really cool to see and kind of fun to see what everyone looked like when they're younger. Um right. yeah, it was more of like an intercommunity intra community project, it felt like. You know, it was mm. more like astrologers will care about like what other astrologers were doing with the first UAC. Right. Not so much anyone else. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't more of a public thing, but more did seem more interesting internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people can check that out and let us know if we forgot or missed any other astrology documentaries or shows or other things that might be fun or useful or interesting for astrologers to check out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there are more, especially fictional movies. So let us know what you think of. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's it for this episode. So thanks everybody for watching this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Thanks to all the patrons for supporting us and making this work possible. And that's it for this episode. So we'll see you again next time. See you next time. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to all the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, Kristen Otero, and Sanjay Srihari. For more information about how to become a patron and get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes or private subscriber-only podcast episodes, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Special thanks also to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, available at mountainastrologer.com, The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, Astro Gold Astrology Software for the Mac operating system, which is available at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 for a 15% discount. The Portland School of Astrology, available at portlandastrology.org. Astro Gold Astrology app for iPhone and Android, which is also available at astrogold.io. And finally, the Solar Fire Astrology Software program for Windows, which you can get from alabe.com and you can use the promo code AP15 for a 15% discount.